All right, people. In alhamdulillahi wa kafa. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al mustafa. Wa ala ibadi ladina taba. Wa man bihudahu mehtada. Let me actually just check. I think I'm not even live. Right. Un momentico. Let me just see that this is live, people. Right, so are we live? We are. For some reason, I can't see it today saying live. It is the right, clear. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban. All right, how you doing? I take it we is live. So, in alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al mustafa wa ala ibadi ladin al tada wa man bi hudahu mihtada wa bi athar ahl al madina tiktafa wa baad. Welcome back, people. All right, so we are. Ah, see, my hair's all over the place. <laughs> we are back, meaning with Maum. Allah, Allah, Allah. So, what is going on? And what will we be taking a look at today whilst you guys. Tune in, click like and share, you know the drill, right? So whilst you guys are doing that, I'll just double check the sound is all good and I'll bring up what we'll be going through. All right, so let me just see. We've got Scorpio, all right. Ahlam wa sah, Shamroz, Ayub al-Maliki. You're doing it, Ayub, looking good, huh? <laughs> shukran, shukran, shukran. Wasam Wahbi, right, all right. Yep, sound is good. Shukran, Scorpio, Wasam. I appreciate it. Shukran. I believe I got your message, Wasam. Is it, if I'm correct, from Australia? Is that is that the one? Uh, the Instagram message. I was reading it, I think, earlier on today. Uh, Nora from Florida. You doing it shukran shukran right we've got chemical chemical tolly <laughs> uh it's quite a scary name but lillah alhamd yes we um, that's the one yep that's it that's the one i thought so um how has my day been yeah it's it's been good it's been um you know every day Every moment is always good. It's just interesting differently. <laughs> it adds. And that's what I want to take a look at today. Let's uh, see that what we want to explore is life, people, life. Life, that's what I'm talking about. Why? Because life chose you. Allahu Akbar. And it did in in many and in every way. You see, you uh, when you came to you by before you even came to your senses, if you ever think to yourself, why me? That's because life chose you. And I want to take a li little look at that today. The and the ephemeral nature the fleeting nature of life people the quranic guidance on that i want to bring in uh following on from that a study by brony weir uh, which is on regrets so i want to take a look at that because i feel it's very relevant and then also a review of the jpb jordan peterson the <laughs> broadcast, I take it, but the Jordan Peterson dialogue, um, his podcast with uh, Dr. Mustafa Akiol, and I want to go over that as well. So that's what we'll be taking a look at today, and then I'll take on live guests. Um, why don't you ever check your inbox? Va? <laughs> For a moment, would forget who. Uh, <laughs> Acha, 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 acha. Why don't I ever check my inbox? I'm sorry. Am I going to be fired? <laughs> I do check my inbox, but um, 
I tend to check more so on Instagram. I don't know, you know, that's um, it's an interesting point. I've, it's, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, hmm. I find myself on a different plane of consciousness in recent times. And I'm just not in certain places, maybe where I was or how, and I don't, I don't know. I, I find some things like, I just don't find them that, um, I, I can't explain it, but I don't find, I'm losing interest, am I? <laughs> in a lot of this social media participation. I mean, I still do, obviously I'm do I, I'm on YouTube and I'm on Instagram. I'm on, I'm on all the platforms or most of them still. But I, I'm just there's an I don't know if it's just me or maybe there's an there's an air of it, and uh, maybe it's the collective consciousness that there's there's a disenchantment and. Hmm, like I just don't see it. So basically you find our message is boring. <laughs> well, you know, uh uh right, which is you have changed your previous environment. No, it's it's not even that. It's I don't know. I'm on a plane of consciousness currently. And maybe for some weeks now. And it's just, it's different. You're on a different floor. <laughs> and in this floor, there are different things. There are different experiences. And there are different engagements. And maybe... You know, there are new meanings. And then all of a sudden, the floor, the other floor, you're, you're not on that floor anymore. <laughs> In this building we call the cosmos or being. And I feel that, yeah, it's hard to articulate. But it's just, I mean, I'm still, I still, you know, I'm very much in touch with, my kind of stuff. I'm still doing my stuff. I'm still my um, my own kind of things and my own friends. And there's obviously you guys, you precious people. There's Patreons. I still have my sessions, one to ones, and we just had a group session this Monday gone. And there's a group session coming up this next Monday as well uh, for tiers one to three. But there's so it's, it's not that things ain't happening. But I find. A certain, I don't know, it's just, mm, I don't really see the allure in certain things anymore. Right. Nora, shukran, shukran, much love for the Super J. Please say hello to my daughter, Vivian. Hola, hello, and assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to have you on live with us all the way from Florida. So Vivian, shukran, muchas gracias. All right, so what is going on? After taking DMT, social media isn't that interesting. <laughs> uh, hmm. It's these planes of consciousness. As a person travels between them, Life is still life, but it's the texture of its fabric changes. Um, it's simple, Mufti. It's Netflix, nothing else. No, I find even Netflix boring nowadays. Um, your breath of fresh air. Shukran, Adam. I appreciate it. Shukran. Hayak Allah. And it is, it's probably this clear, you're right, it's old age. 
<laughs> it's not that I feel old, not that I think I am so old, but I mean, it's not that. But you're right, it's probably life, which is very relevant to, de to today and what I want to cover with us. Because it's just, it's, you know, there's, there's so much to absorb and and sometimes it's it's just yeah but you, you you're doing the same rut the same rut you get tired and social media i think is wonderful for its purposes but it's so you know just down there <laughs> it's so down there it's not really uh what's this spotlight layout what is one of them news layout Press shift and five. Okay. How does that work? Oh, that's the news layer. I get it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just read something. So today, what we're going to be taking a look at are these topics. Hope you guys are doing well. I did want to speak about, um, uh, do a review of the podcast. I did watch it uh, between Jordan Peterson I know people's views and thoughts on uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson are divided. But yeah, I kind of like him. I do like him. Not kind of. I do like him. Why lie? <laughs> Be transparent. <laughs> Why make it clear? So I do like him. It's because I, I love his profundity. I love his... Um, uh, I understand people, a lot of people, especially young people, uh, don't like him. And But I think, you know what, I think even if people don't like him, it doesn't mean that he shouldn't be liked by other people, you understand? Because sometimes some people have this thing that, oh my God, I don't like this person, nobody should like him. <laughs> That's not life, okay? That's not how it should be. So, okay. Mufti, could you um, comment on the hadith about the Prophet and him washing up from a well where garbage is thrown, please? Adam Barber, uh, Barbatov. Okay, of course, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Sean, uh, Jordan Peterson recorded with hijab. Mufti, you should be next. Yeah, I'd love to. Or at least, you know what I'm liking? I'm, I'm liking the fact... Uh, um, I'm liking the fact that Jordan Peterson has started a a, com a series, inshallah, of conversations with Muslims. I didn't, to be honest, when he said, I, I get it, look, he's not Muslim, and he has his, and we can't expect people to always see things from other people's perspectives. And when he did say about the Prophet as a warlord and things like this, I didn't like that. Um, and I understand what he's trying to say. I understand he's trying to say, well, the prophet participated in war and he led tribes in war. Therefore, you could call him a warlord. Um, but I also at the same time felt, you know, for a person who's so incredibly sensible and profound, <laughs> you know, who's so profound, uh, that's such an um, ill-sensible, um, ill-advised choice of words for the prophet who's so you know this so beloved and so beloved and so um dear to you know a percentage of the entire globe so i just felt mm, you know but i do generally i i love what jordan peterson does and what he's been doing and the fact he's opened these conversations i've really wanted the conversation between him and sheikh hamza yusuf to happen I hope it does happen because I think that would be groundbreaking. Um, and the fact that he's now starting to have, I heard today he'd uh, had a conversation uh, with uh, Muhammad Hijab. So this goes to show, well, okay, there's a series of conversations that have begun. And that's fine. And that's good because everybody should get to talk. You understand? Um, and people should be exposed to different kind of understanding that people can choose, people can see how does such and such a person express themselves, how do other people express themselves, how do, um, 
and it gives and the main thing is that a conversation is in process people are talking that's the you know it's good to talk and and i like that shukran i see saracen mufti just take a break <laughs> i think that's what i'm always doing that's my problem <laughs> i'm always taking a break so right now if there's who's this speaking to if there's blackmailing i don't know who are you who is madia replying to uh i'm not sure there's probably some uh religious blackmailing All right sean doe saying answer me for beep sake mufti i've been trying to contact you for such a long time uh you i'm in need of help i've been suffering severe depression and disorder um please get in touch you're my only hope wow okay may sorry for the excuse the the bad language there people uh may allah make things easy for you sean though um i make dua for you obviously i've not seen your message but what i would say is um what i would say is if if you see it sounds like you've got a lot going on in terms of like you're mentioning mental health issues contact a professional contact a doctor seek um medical assistance seek therapeutic interventions um these things are how this is done okay this is not going to be done via sending a sheikh a message on facebook it's not going it's not going to happen i mean nothing you know what what do people you i mean what do i don't know what magic people are expecting me to be able to do like that what what you expect me to do imagine i i message someone hey my life's messed up there you go help <laughs> i mean what would you expect the person to do i mean what you can do if you want sessions i do offer sessions you can book yourself in through patreon you can go to my instagram on the top highlights it shows you the instructions how to book in one to one sessions you can book that that's an opportunity for people um it guides you through it gives you all the instructions to go into patreon obviously it is a uh, it does cost but you could i would say if that's what you're in need of if you're in need of things like uh, medical intervention then you know i'm not going to messaging i'm not going to be able to do any miracles you need to contact a doctor you need to contact uh, your local mental health kind of experts and speak to them okay but i'm also if if i can be of help you feel free to reach out to me don't expect miracles through and don't expect any kind of um i don't know like some kind of overwhelming don't expect so much substance from me in messages because i'm just being honest it's not going to happen because i i get so many messages i'm not you know like somebody sends a message oh mufti you know oh i i can't find you you know the amount of questions i get like oh mufti i can't find this i want no have you <laughs> can you answer this question and it'll be a simple question which i've answered and i'll say find it on youtube and they'll be like oh can you send me the link i'll be like no i can't because you know that's the least you can do is search for keywords i mean if you can't even search for keywords for god's sake just pack it in right now <laughs> you know that you have to do in this world one must do to get you see so don't just don't ever expect there nobody's coming for help nobody's coming there is no cavalry there is no reinforcements you have to pull yourself up and get stuff done and when people send me sometimes their situation i do try depending on situation i may you know i may send a little voice note i may just say you know make a little dua for the person tell them seek help don't worry about it don't stress yourself out too much 
You know, th that's all I can really do in a message. I mean, what I'm not going to now, let's just be honest. I mean, you're not going to get a message from someone and now just start writing a 5,000 word essay in reply to someone. So not to belittle from their problems because, you know, may Allah make it easy for them, but they have to be realistic as well. They can't think, you know, I'm going to write to some mufti or some sheikh or some imam or some maulana or some, and in a text message and get my life sorted out. It just ain't going to happen. So proactive steps, you know, if you're suffering from mental health issues, first thing is get medical help, okay? Get counselling. Uh, if Change your lifestyle habits, okay? The physiology affects the psychology. If you're not doing anything healthy, start doing healthy. Start going to the gym. Start going for a run. Start going for a walk. Start immediately with some press-ups. Start something. Start now. Change your diet. Okay? Start eating a bit healthier. Start change. In, make sure you're taking all your daily vitamins. You're taking daily amino acids. Okay? Do all of that. Change your circle of friends. Create new friends. Create a new hobby. Right? What have you always been interested in? Start learning about it. Go on YouTube. Watch some clips. Have you always wanted to draw? Have you always wanted to do poetry? Have you always wanted to, I don't know, learn electri electrics or become a mechanic or, I don't know, do whatever it is you want to do. Go hiking. You want to discover places. You want to start doing that. Have you got a job? No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Get into it. No. Get a job. You know, like you have to do so many things in life and of course reach out to people reach out to me you know if i can help you i'll help you if you want intense actual interactive sessions book yourself in through patreon and i'll give you sessions but once again it's not miracles you see you have to help will come but you must take the first step you know the hadith allah says my my person he walks towards me for i run to him but who walks first? You see, the person takes the first step. Then Allah comes rushing to save him. He must take that first step. The journey of a thousand miles, it begins with that first step, as Lao Tzu has said. So may Allah make things easy for you and for everyone who is struggling. Ameen. Well, for my name is Muhammad, but everyone calls me Hamid. Love you for the sake of Allah. Gio, Gio. May Allah bless you. Keep you smiling. Hamid. I take it that's for Hamid. Uh, so, shukran, shukran. Right. Um, I had a friend suffering from depression, but he said something impressive. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. Wow. You know, let's, let's just take a, a minute on that. You know, firstly, I make dua. Anybody suffering from depression, may Allah make things easy for them, grant them shifa. Secondly, they need to, they need to pull themselves up from the bootstraps. They need to move forward in life. You need to wake up and you need to choose life. That's what you need to do. Okay, you can tell me it's tough and tough it is. So what if it's tough? You got to do it. That is life. There is someone in a hospital bed near you, near you, begging, crying, to Allah for the opportunities that you have, you. Don't you dare let these opportunities go to waste. Embrace them. Take that step. If you are grateful, Allah will increase it for you. Things will change, but take that step. Right. All right. I wonder if I 
I think Mufti is unaware sometimes of his unique voice and the huge void he fills for alienated Muslims. The sense of urgency when people try to reach Mufti for their problem. That could be <laughs> that could be a point because I genuinely don't <laughs> feel that I'm in any way like that. I don't yeah, I guess it's you know, it's 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 always wonderful to hear it. It's always wonderful to hear it because I don't you're right, I don't <laughs> it's like I don't believe it. So, <laughs> yeah. Shukran, Osman. Shukran. Um, some. <sighs> All right, so you, Vah, Farhan, Akram, Shukran, Shukran, much love, stay blessed. Um, you give for you to turn your back, come with groundbreaking treasuries. I haven't turned my back on any. Oh my, look, I, I'm, you know, it's not, <laughs> everybody is still there, the world is still going on as it is and everything all my clips and everything are still there you can still watch them detailed breakdowns i cover every week quranic guidance i take people live you know you can come on live when i share the clip come on live uh, look i this is me giving f for free i sit here for hours every week I, I put the link out sometimes nobody wants to come on you know, I mean, people do come on, okay, fair play, <laughs> but sometimes it has happened that only one person, two people come on, but I give them the opportunity, this is for free, I mean, there's no, you know, I'm not, it doesn't, it's it's an opportunity to say, hey, jump on, let's have a conversation, it's a, a weekly surgery, if you like, and I do that, and I do give from my time, but you have to understand as well that, you know, you, it's difficult, because, dealing with the we have to all face our own shadow okay and we have to go through it so right let's take a look uh what's this um I, it's true mufti muhammad hijab wouldn't get a request like that I'm not sure which request that is. Oh, like for somebody to Nasgath, I think your fear of losing your faith is a testament to how strong your faith is. Yes, exactly. I mean, don't you know? Don't don't kind of fret over my iman is going, my iman is going, my iman is going. It isn't going anywhere. <laughs> it's right there. It's with you. It's in your heart. God is not going anywhere. You are safely nested. Just stop panicking. Surrender. Let go. Allah. That is it. You see, it's not, you guys, you're panicking. There's nothing to panic about. You're creating a, a false sense of fear. Let me bring up what I'd like us to take a look at today. So let me play this. Mm -hmm. Taking Right, those of you who haven't caught up on the book lounge, the bonobo and the atheist, a uh, wonderful discussion with the team, which reminds me that we have that that's this month's book by oliver sachs it's amazing um i've put in there a little quote by rumi maulana the cure for pain is in the pain <laughs> i love it i love it uh ghalib has something like that by the way that as the pain exceeds the boundaries it becomes the cure and I suppose in uh, Abu Nawas, what da we need billati cannot hear that. And give me the, the the disease for as the cure. Cure me with the with the illness itself. So this is a common motif used by poets. 
Right. So the book lounge this month, it's Awakenings. We have got a few slots because uh, so if people are interested, only if you're interested and you're committed, there are serious conditions. I don't take, you know, on the book lounge thing, I don't take no slacking. So you must be actually interested in reading a book each month and you must be interested in participating in the discussion at the end of the month. So that's uh, a necessary condition. If you are prepared to do that, reach out to Lee Kadan. I'll uh somebody will just write it in the in the comments there and i've got it i've got it on my instagram story as well you can reach out to lee that's spelled l-e-i-g-h and kadan k-a-d-a-n-e and she will then guide you through the process she's managing that and it is it's it's a wonderful way to corner yourself to read something new every month you know because it's and it gets you to have discussions with people. It gets you to, you know, become a part of something new. And and I'm just as well involved in that as well, because I sometimes in the month, I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't read the book yet. Damn. <laughs> I'm like, I better start reading. I better start listening to some of it on Audible. And sometimes I'm having to catch up like that in between with both. You know, I've got to do a drive. And whilst I'm driving, I'll listen to certain amounts and then I'll carry on reading and but it really gets you through some interesting material each month and the books I choose are usually of that nature that will give you some perspective on life so the bonobo and the atheist was epic for that this month's awakenings by Dr Oliver Sacks one of the leading world you know renowned psychiatrists and psychologists I was fortunate enough to attend his lecture um, early last decade and it was about happiness and he was the keynote speaker uh he'd been flown in and so his, his work has just been groundbreaking and this is an amazing book it's got a movie made on it with robin williams with robert de niro and it's just wow so and, and there's a lot of youtube discussions on it there's interviews there's a whole plethora of stuff to absorb become a part of discuss you know this is life yeah <laughs> you got to learn something. What have you learned today? What have you learned this week? And you can talk about these things for the rest of your life. Uh, any book or you recommend it? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, what I do is every month, um, every month we choose a new book. So we've got a Discord server called the Book Lounge. And... We choose a book and then we read it on our own. During the month, people might share quotes, they might share stuff, thoughts, they might have their little discussions in the in the Discord server. This is only to do with the book cloud. It's not, you know, Q and A. It's not, you know, Islamic stuff. It's not that kind of mufti stuff. It's just I'm on it, but that's what it is. So it's not about being hijacked for other discussions, and. Then at the end of the month, we do a live stream from Discord. We come up, we have our discussion. So it's usually about anything like one and a half hours long. And we just talk about the book, different things, what was fascinating, and just have a conversation. And that's it. And each month we choose a new book. So those of you interested, we've got some more spaces. Right. So uh, Mufti Movie Lounge. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll do that at some point, but not right now. <laughs> Uh, have I missed a super chat? Um, Jagroop Singh. All right. Ahlam wa sahlan. Sasriyakal. Jagroop. Gee, sir, Mufti, what's your view about Abdullah ibn Sabah? Do you believe he played a part in the first fitna? Because he, or was he a, or is he a forged character to shield the Sahaba? Wow. That's a quite a, I'm I'm impressed, Jagroop. Uh, I take it you're not Muslim, so your research into Islam is definitely um, intriguing and interesting and, and good. Right, so Abdullah ibn Sabah, hmm, I don't know if he's an entirely forged character. I think it's probably the truth often lies off somewhere in the middle, that there are things that there most likely was a person and he probably was asking certain critical questions, but maybe he wasn't 
going the full way as some people exaggerated as in some people say you know he gave birth to the whole shia cult and he this was some great jewish conspiracy and obviously that's not true <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take many brain cells to know that's not true. But does it mean this person was an absolute forgery and the whole thing never even existed? And the whole, um, somebody just later on concocted this whole uh, fantasy. That doesn't have to, to be true either. That something somewhere in the middle. The events happened as they did. Abdullah ibn Sabah was not the 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 you know the prime mover for the for the events but he is a name that appears now there so i believe there may have been i don't think he necessarily is fictitious there may have been this person and he may have also sided with the people that were causing some trouble but there were many people that were causing trouble at the time many of the the chiefs um of the rebels the insurgents that later on fled back to Basra and Kufa and different places. Many people were that attacked the house of Osman. So, yeah, I think to just it's such reductionism is quite simplistic in in my thinking. Um, Uh, Jay, although there's several people who had the title Ibn Saba in history. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's a chance. Yes, I mean, there's a chance, of course, that he's entirely fictitious. I don't deny that. But I'm saying that they, I feel personally, I would think that somebody did exist with that name. and But it's not as the, the, the Goliath that they made him out to be. But he's not innocent either. And he's probably somebody that also got involved um, amongst many other people that were causing trouble. And for some reason, his name has been echoed throughout time. All right. So, yeah. Mm. Much love. Fahad, you do in it. Much love. Much love. What's this? Now I go for study thank you all again may allah keep us safe shukran shukran much love may allah keep you blessed safe and smiling right so somebody's asking please bring a shia muslim onto mind trap next that's a good thought you know i i, I will reach out to some uh shia brethren and ask them inshallah i have in the past already but I take it they were just too busy and they didn't. But I'll ask, let me, why not? That would be an interesting discussion. In fact, I don't know if this is rumors or not, but somebody sent me a clip um, with, uh, I, I've, I've got to actually WhatsApp him and ask him with uh, Raza, I believe, uh, from Hyde Park. And we've, and we communicate, we have a, a, a good friendship. So somebody sent me a clip about some people discussing him saying he's changed a lot of his Shia views. I don't know whether that's fabric, whether that's all made up or legitimate or some of it is or isn't, but I just watched about 20 seconds of it. But I did think, oh, you know, I'll send him a message and I'll want, you know, I wonder, is there any truth to this? And and I'd love to get him on a discussion and discuss that. If so, what and, you know, why the changes, if they be true. Um, yes, Raza I'm speaking about. Yes, yes. No, not Raza Aslan. No, 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 not Raza. I'm, I mean, <laughs> Sayyid Raza from uh, from London. Okay, right, let's begin. Bismillah. So, mm -hmm. let this just... Bismillah, people. Guys, I wanted to speak about life, okay? And why I say this is you'll understand... Obviously, this sounds like common sense life because we all have it. 
But let's reflect on some Quranic guidance. We'll go through some of the verses, then we're going to come back to the discussion. You've got there from Surah An-Nahl, verse 77. That وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ أو هو أقرب إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ That is such a powerful, such a powerful verse. You see, to Allah belongs the unseen. Because what does that mean, the unseen? It also... Yes, it means that that which you don't know, it means the afterlife, it means pre-existence, it means all of this. Yes, of course. Ah, but it also means all the goodness that is yet to come. It also means all the achievements, the accomplishments in life that may happen or may not. It also includes all the suffering which may or may not happen and includes everything allah lillahi ghaybus samawati wal ard allah has he has that that all belongs to him it is not a matter for you it is not for you to feel that you know this you have this with certainty you don't have any certainty on the matter that wa ma amru sa'a and you see, it's amazing because sa'a the moment. A sa'a. A sa'a, people use it because it means the hour in Arabic, which it does, like a sa'a, kami sa'a in Arabic, what, what's, the, what's the time? But a sa'a can mean a watch or a clock or an hour, but it can also mean the moment, gari, the, the actual, the hour of this, the hour of death. The hour of the reckoning, the hour of the afterlife, the hour of annihilation. You see, وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ It is but just a blinking of an eye. You see, because when you when you think about it, time is relative. People just have to fluctuate their planes of consciousness and they become aware of time being so relative. Even though we share in this intersubjective relativity, but it doesn't really exist. And at that moment, everything is just like Kalam Hil Basar. Like the blinking of an eye. And then Allah says, O oh, huwa aqrab. <laughs> or is it quicker still? Or is it faster than even the blinking of an eye? Perhaps. You see, in life, every, every memory, Every experience, it's the past. You see, if it's it's gone, you're not in it. It's just being fed back to you in a loop. You are not a part of that past now. I mean, it is your past, but it's gone. <laughs> I say this and this moment has now passed. We are in the next moment. And every future to come, it's something which, it is always just an anticipation. All we ever have is the everlasting now. Hence the philosophers, you see the philosophical question that if everything, imagine the whole world just began right now, but we'd been implanted with the memories of our past. We could never know because we would just think it all happened. Like, no, there was a past because it's in our memory. <laughs> but what if the whole world was just put together at this very moment right now? And we just had these memories. We would think, oh, it, it existed and all this happened. 
and all these things. And you could say, well, but they've got artifacts and they've got bones and they've got all, the, but all that's put together right now with the memory that it was ancient. <laughs> there would be no way to discern the difference. We, we couldn't tell. We would assume it was just as it, as it is now. You see? And like that, the hour comes. It is like the blinking, the flashing of an eye. And Allah says, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah has power over all. Just... And this, in many ways, can also be seen to about going back to the beginning of the verse, the unseen. Because life, I want to speak about life. People discussing today that look, you know, sad things are happening in their lives. But how do you know great things aren't destined for you? How do you know? But you've got to, you've got to go there. You've got to take the step. You've got to. Smile. <laughs> you know, smile, laugh a little. You see, in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is all powerful. Over Allah has power over all of these things. Do you have the power to take the first step? Do you? You see? So such a powerful verse from Surah Al Nahal. Verse 77. And in that light, Allah says in the second verse, وَمِنْهُمْ مِنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ It's one of the most powerful, beautiful du'as of the Qur'an. Sums life up. Live life to the fullest. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا Give us the best right here. <laughs> and give us the best afterwards. Just give us the best. Save us from damnation. And that by extension can be any and every harm. Save us from harm, from negativity. We don't need negativity. You want positivity. Love, compassion. You are asking Allah. Allah is teaching you this dua in the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, verse 201, that hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana. just make it all good. Why wake up and choose suffering? Wake up and choose life. It's already been given to you. And Allah is saying, teaching you, ask for this. Why ask for it? You think, why is, why is Allah saying, ask for it? Why? Because he can just give it. By asking, by verbalizing. You see, the ulama say that the Quran, it, you can just say it in your mind. Dua can just be in your mind. But they say, articulate it, verbalize it. And they say, you know, with each nutq of the speech, there is a reward. They're enticing you to say it. Why? Because by saying it, you see, you're hearing it. You're hearing it within. It is altering your mindset. You've already taken a step towards it. You've already said it. Like, give us goodness. Now, why should... This theme isn't about being... You know, depressed or being sad or being a hermit or being ascetic or being or going through suffering and sacrifice. Sure, these things may happen, but the deen isn't about that. You choose to live it to its fullest. So this is one of the most powerful du'as. And in light of those verses, you've got another verse as well. I can... Oh, it's brought it up. Which is in Surah Al-Nahal. You've got it in Surah Al-Nahal. Otherwise, I could just bring it up here. Um, that in Surah Al-Nahal, verse 30. وَقِيلَ لِلَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ مَاذَا أَنزَلَ رَبُّكُمْ And it is said to those 
it is said to those people, you see, that that are mindful of God. They have God consciousness. See, what has your Lord now, this doesn't just, obviously, Anzala can mean present down, but what has your God even done for you? What is it, you know, by extension, what has God even done for you? What has he brought you? What has he sent down for you? Qalu <laughs> khayran. Allah. They said goodness. Look at the answer. If they're, they're not saying, oh, he sent down a list of rules or he sent down a, he's trying, he sent goodness. Sums it all up. You know, you're asking me what has God, he's done greatness for us. That, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا Those who are people of Ihsan, and this is this kind of, compassion, this positivity, those who are people of this, there is goodness for them in this world. That fi dunya hasana, that that's what these people will have. They will have goodness in this world. darul akhira khair. And yet this life isn't everything. This life isn't everything. It's a comma, not a full stop. What's to come is even better. Allah. <laughs> and what an abode for those who are mindful, who are God conscious. Some amazing, incredibly powerful verses to remind us all. So I wanted to bring that to our attention. And in light of that, I wanted to show us there was a study. Right, if I just bring this up. Let me just bring that back up. Oh, it's frozen. Right, in light of that, I wanted us to, to understand on life that was done by Bronnie Weir and it's something very popular that many of us have uh, have already seen or read about in different articles it's been covered uh, extensively so here it is and it ties in exactly perfectly with with what we're taking a look at Bronnie where what she had done, she is an author and a writer who worked, spent many years of her life in palliative care, working with those people who were about to pass away. And so they've got limited time, often suffering from terminal illnesses. And what she did is she went around having conversations with these people, those who had anything from 12 weeks to just a couple of days left to live. And she discussed with them what they at this stage, this final frontier, you know, before the lifting of the final veil, what they regretted about life. And wallahi, in this is such a profound, uh, an abra for us all. So she then summarizes them into the top five. And right, so now this is five working down in descending order. I wish that I had let myself be happier. You see, now that, that's a summary of it. The so called comfort or familiarity overflowed into their emotions as well as their physical lives. Fear of change had them pretending to others and to themselves that they were content, when deep down within, they longed to laugh properly and have silliness in their life again. Allah. Don't ever let people tell you that you laugh too much. Don't ever have people rob you of those moments of silliness. 
B, seize the opportunity to smile, to be happy. This came as the fifth she, that this was in descending order she had compiled them and this it really they they ring true to so many of us number four i wish i had stayed in touch with my friends that often they would not truly realize the full benefits of old friends until their dying weeks and it was not always possible to track them down Many had become so caught up in their own lives that they had let golden friendships slip by over the years. There were many deep regrets about not giving friendship the time and effort that they deserved. Everyone misses their friends when they are dying. Wow. You know, life. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an when he was asked um, about the joys of life. And he said, I sum it into three. And one of the three that he puts is muhadatha, muhadatha al ikhwan. And here by ikhwan, he means friends or ashab, I think in another narration, that just the company and conversing with friends. It truly is a joy in this place we call life, Allah. And then number three, out of these top five, I wish I'd had the courage, uh, sorry, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Many people suppress their feelings in order to keep peace with others. As a result, they settled for a mediocre existence and never became who they were truly capable of becoming. Many developed illnesses related to the bitterness and resentment they carried as a result. Allah. You know, within us, there is this spirit, this potentiality that wants to be, what's the, what's the word? Um, and ah, it's, it's going to be on the tip of my tongue now. Oh, damn. What's the, <laughs> anyway, I'll come back to it. The. Um. Oh, I can't. It'll come to me. But the the term used often by Aristotle to represent um, the potentiality, the ah, uh, uh, what's it called? But anyway, you see, within us, we all have that experience that we all have this drive, this yearning. That is the, it is almost the ruh trying to fledge and give drive to that. But people suppress throughout this life just to appease people, just to, you know, fit in with a little crowd or maybe somebody wanted to do something, but just because maybe his parents, he thought they, mm, he or she thought they wouldn't like it. Maybe somebody, peer pressure, they thought their friends wouldn't like it. Their spouse, maybe their children, I don't know. Maybe just they just thought people, without even taking people into consideration. Um, this, it is such a, such a thought. I don't know why this keeps there it is number two ah this is there it is 
I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Wow. This came from every male patient that I nursed. They missed their children's youth and their partner's companionship. Women also spoke of this regret, but as most were from an older generation, many of the female patients had, had not been breadwinners. All of the men I nursed deeply regretted spending so much of their lives on the treadmill of a work existence. Allah, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. That is so true. Enteleki, that's that's the one. Shukran, shukran. Absolutely, I was referring to that. Enteleki, that's the potentiality that can be actualized, which Aristotle speaks of. So, you see, look at this. And don't confuse this with achieving your dreams. Because sometimes you have to. You have to deep dive you have to be submerged in your passion to achieve it somebody may think you know i the, i want to write i want to write a book somebody may think i want to write poetry i want to do art i want to create art somebody may think i want to climb mount everest this is my passion in life somebody may have a startup idea a business and they want to run that somebody probably runs a restaurant or they they do these things in life will by their nature consume you to an extent and that is not what this is talking about because that is a passion that a person is doing and it will there will be a stage where it has to consume you but there is a balance and many people in life they don't it's not that they were consumed by passion they weren't consumed by these years where they, which they regret. These years that they say, I wish I didn't work so hard, were not years that they spent climbing Mount Everest and doing these kind of things. These years were drowned in an ocean of meaningless monotony. That's what they were. It was just nothingness. It was nine to five, putting food on the table, but getting lost in the rut. And that is important to put food on. It is a, a great accomplishment. You know, may Allah bless all these people that try that work hard. But there was, it's the mindset, missing out on those little moments playing with their children, even a little, being silly with them, joking, laughing, even going for a walk. It doesn't have to. See, things don't have to be. So it's not an all or nothing, zero-sum game. It's not that, well, I haven't got money, otherwise I'd be in Disneyland or with my children, but because I haven't got that, we don't do anything. You see, it's not the it's not the materials. It's the connection. It's the experience, what you absorb. So I wish I hadn't worked so hard. That is honestly something that you and I could see that written on the epitaph of so many people on their tombstones. And the most bringing it to number one, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected from me. This was the most common regret of all. When people realize that their life is almost over and they look back clearly on it, it is easy to see how many dreams have gone unfulfilled. Most people had not honored even half of their dreams and had to die knowing that it was due to choices they had made or not made. Health brings a freedom very few realize until they no longer 
Hafid. Allah. You see, this, this is why I thought it's so important to bring this, to share this. We can relate. You know, it's not about the quantity of life. It's not about the number, the hours, the, the counting of the moments. It's about the moment and how much quality it has in it. That I wish I'd lived a life more true to myself. <coughs> Allah. And seriously, we, we especially when that's coming from people in palliative care, it hits so hard, as you can imagine. Right now, we've got here, let me just bring this, a hadith that I want to share with you that's to do with this. That sees five before five. Shababak qabla haramik. Your youth before your old age. Wasihatak qabla suqmik. Your health before your illness. Waghinak qabla faqrik. Your wealth. Your wealth before your poverty. وَفَرَاغَكْ قَبْلَ شُغْلِكْ And your free time before you become busy. وَحَيَاتَكْ قَبْلَ مَوْتِكْ And your life before its death. اغتنم, this is the Prophet of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Seize! اغتنم is to seize. A ghaniman, like to you, seized it, seized five before five. Now, it, we just have to, it's important to remind ourselves and others around us, don't be a part of the world, make money, do businesses, you know, follow passions, but balance it out. Value friendship. Enjoy your spare time. Make spare time. Enjoy your health. So it's such a powerful reminder. This it really ties in so amazingly with all of these, um, with this study and the verses that we looked at as well. Right, so. I thought I'd share that. The verses of the Quran really wrap that up. A person may say, well, you know, what should we ask God for in this life? Atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Give us goodness here, positivity, amazing stuff, and forever. It doesn't just have to be here. It can be in the afterlife. Be here and in the afterlife. And just protect us always from all negativity, from all harmful influences, from all losses, from all suffering, from all damnation. So, yes, sir, Allah, may Allah make things easy for each and all and bless each and all. I really want to share this reminder. It was something I've come across this study on many occasions. And... Every time I felt that, you know what, it always hits me. <laughs> it hits me so powerfully. And I always feel I've got to share this. And today I thought I want to share that. Well, I'm going to be honest. Was this Hassan Kotiwala? <laughs> Kotiwala. <laughs> uh, that sounds a bit off in uh, in Urdu. I'm going to be honest. Brother, how do you get your hair looking like that at your age? The Lord gives. <laughs> and you know what the Lord says? There's much more greatness to come yet. Allah, Allah, Allah. So, people, what is going on? Yeah. 
nobody buys time and money can't buy health. I knew that too since nine years old. Um, I, I read somewhere that there's an amazing saying. It says, a healthy person has a thousand wishes, but an ill person just has one. And that's very profound, very profound. So people, what I'm going to do is I'll share the link shortly. Actually, I'm going to go over the review, almost forgot, of uh, Jordan, <laughs> Jordan Peterson and Mustafa Ak I keep I keep mixing it up, you know. I keep saying it. This must be the dyslexia. <laughs> Akiol. I keep saying Akol for some reason. Right. So I'll be taking a look at that. Um, Shukran. There was uh, I missed a super chat earlier on by uh, Jagroop Singh. Uh, Shukran. Thank you once again. Not a Muslim yet. <laughs> Islamic history just intrigues me. Your videos are great. Thanks for not being a Wahhabi. <laughs> <laughs> plan on to learning Arabic next. Wow, that's amazing. Honestly, may you know, I'm really grateful to hear that and grateful for you sharing that. I appreciate it. And, and you'll love the Arabic language. Learning is amazing regardless any language. And Arabic is such a profound and rich language of the world that has such a past to it. It opens up so many doors. And yeah, and I think, you know, when you learn Arabic, you will see that the Quran, it will really hit you. Um, I've heard from people how they say uh, the Guru Granth Sahib, people who can understand uh, Guru Mukhi and things that they, they speak of how it has impacted their lives and how it can, you know, it hits them. And I can tell you that the Quran, it hits so powerfully in its native tongue. It's just, it has an amazing and a kind of enveloping uh, flow and, 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 and words to it, meaning that kind of, and it's always, I mean, you can translate things always, but then it's never quite the same. Even with just other literature, translating it is never quite the same. But shukran once again, and I appreciate that, and shukran for the, for the super chat. Rabraka. Right, so, yep, yeah, and to, I'm just going through some of these questions. Uh, of course, was this Sajjad Hussein? That's not Imam Sheikh Sajjad Hussein, is it? <laughs> Allah is a legend, by the way. Uh, somebody, people who ask about learning, Sheikh Sajjad Hussein, who teaches at Sacred Texts Institute. An amazing person to study from. He teaches and he is related to me as well. <laughs> I think it's it's unfortunate for he must get loads of slack. He's related to me. <laughs> but yeah, he's a great person. So but I take it it's not that one. So yep, somebody saying, Do you live close to a pub? <laughs> I do. I live close to more than one pub. But you know. People, the whole world is there for you to embrace it. Allahu Akbar. Not to mean go to a pub. <laughs> that's that's the, that's taking the totally wrong meaning to <laughs> what I'm saying. Sorry for being a semi troll. I'm also a fan of you. Shukran, shukran, um, shukran. I appreciate it. Um, Right, there was a poem I had here somewhere. I did think, you know what, I saw this poem. Ah, shall we, uh, I don't know if we should. This is one of Fani Badayuni, Fani. <laughs> Fani in Arabic means perishing from the word Fana. Okay. So as I would tell you, Usikum anta tafano fi hubbillah qabla an tafno. Allah. See, to advise you to self, to annihilate the ego in the love of God before you perish by his command. <laughs> Allah, Allah. But 
سیز ہر نفس عمر گزشتہ کی ہے میت فانی زندگی نام ہے مر مر کے جیے جانے کا I suppose I'll read that another day because I think we've kind of moved on from that point otherwise I'll just keep going back but he is an epic poet I, I tell you who I have been going through recently as well that's uh, Abdul Hamid Adam I absolutely love Abdul Hamid Adam as well <laughs> <laughs> he's amazing honestly oh his poetry he really uh let me think of some that he um that he says he really uh he likes to provoke as well you see he's one of those provocative but that the poets do that you see the poets do that because it's it's par- it's a paradox it's the motif of paradox that is adopted in poetry so what they do is they they it's they tease <laughs> teasing me they tease with this motif of par, of of the paradox of taboo that they push the boundaries of taboo to unsettle but then to reconnect you with the divine because especially when they're speaking about divine stuff uh, you'll get um people like um abdul hamid adam he says uh and many all of them me all these people they have this constant trope of uh of the taboo and they they intertwine that into the paradox so they will so for example me saying um uh what is uh says uh chhor ke chhor ke der kaabe ko aaya meer you see is that that after there is it's actually in a classical arabic word as well meaning a kind of temple of but he's using it to differentiate it from muslims that chhor ke der kaabe ko aaya meer jis ko chahe khuda kharab kare you see all of a sudden he he says after leaving the deir that temple meer has come to the kaaba and and that's you see it's taking this avenue and then what he does is he he applies the paradox pushing the taboo he says jis ko chahe whosoever god wants he corrupts and you're like what <laughs> you see it's the the volta it's the turn that you think you're not expecting it but in that taboo what he's doing it's the it's the the the, the paradox of profanity but he's pushing your your kind of safety zone your comfort to make you question once again that you're not just falling into meaningless superstitious worship are you that ultimately it is still god you see because he's affirming khuda god it's a, it's a huge it's an immensely you know when you go into the 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 kind of the algorithm of what the poets are doing it's very deep it's not just like some people they oh my god that sounds profane on some levels of course it's superficially profane but that's how they you see that's how they get in to make you question once again existentially and not just to simply blindly submit but to holistically submit to the will of god it's amazing and you see abdul hamid adam has loads like that as well and he says uh, kaise mahol mein kis sidq se kya yaad aaya that in what environment with what truthfulness what wow what did we remember kya yaad aaya humko humko but khane ki chokat par khuda yaad aaya this kaise mahol mein kis sidq se kya yaad aaya humko but khane ki chokat par khuda yaad aaya that he says it was at the doorstep of the place of idolatry 
Allah. Butkhana is a place where idols are kept. One could also say it's it's a term the poets used for, you know, for beautiful people, for women that were had of astounding uh, beauty. They used to call them but as well in in Urdu, and also sanam, which also means an idol, because they were kind of. It's the same. It's the reason goddesses are called that, but that's what the Urdu poets. But he's saying that at the doorsteps of this place of idolatry of idols i remembered god <laughs> allah you see once again like just tampering on the profane bringing in the paradox but thereby reminding you of the divine it's it's incredible and they do that and they do it so effectively and they don't want you to get lost in in these symbols they want you to understand that there is a greater like don't get lo don't lose yourself in the symbols try to aspire to something higher the divine so this is why the, the kaaba is often a common motif a common trope used in urdu poetry so abdul hamid adam in that same poem i believe he goes on to say um he says um there, see the there and the Kaaba is often one. There's this juxtaposing of the two as a motif amongst many Urdu legendary poets. Like all of these, often Mir, Ghalib, Dar, you know, Zawq, all these kind of people, Momin Khan, Momin, all these great people will use this. Adam, so he says, Der ke beach khuda, or Kaabe me patthar. <laughs> so he says that he says that amongst the temple I found God. You see that even if I was surrounded by idols, he's saying that I saw my connection with God. It, it, I found it in a place where you'd least expect it. You see, you've you're lost in the world. You're in all these things. You're submerged. You know, you're submerged. You're drowning. You, all these things are happening. This is not the place you'll find God. But He found God. You see, never give up on hope that there ke beach khuda. And then He juxtaposes it with the paradox of the profane. <laughs> Allah, or kabe me patar. He says, hope oh, and. And what is the, in the Kaaba? There's a stone, the black stone. You see, showing that don't take your piety for granted. You don't want to become somebody that is ultimately no different because of your arrogance. It's as though you're just worshipping a stone. Or Kaabe me patar. That hame chubi yaad aya barvakto bajayada. That whatever and whenever we remembered, it was always on point and with great accuracy. <laughs> See, oh, it's amazing, honestly. I could just get lost in poetry for for so long. I, I get into like an, you know, when I hear it, I guess I get proper excited. <laughs> it like brings me to life. It animates me. I love listening to this kind of poetry and love listening to people talking about it. And um, so, what's going on? What's somebody saying? Farid is just repeating the words of the other guys around him. Understanding flexibility of the mind, absorbing its worlds and signs. And what Farid? You know what? Let's break that circle of toxicity. Okay. Show these people some love. Okay. Show them what the true message ought to be about. <laughs> See, we're not on that plane. There's nobody on that floor. We are on a different plane of consciousness. The Dean should boost your life with positivity, compassion, 
and love. And if it hasn't done that, then you need to start looking at why not. And people may be stuck. It's, you know, may Allah grant them happiness as well. I mean, you know, may Allah make them smile, keep them happy as well. They're obviously stuck in some rut. You understand? They need to just let go, to surrender. I tell you, you know, a lot of people that are stuck in this kind of religious toxicity, their souls are hurting. There's a pain deep down. They don't understand it, but it's there. It's hurting them. Now may Allah make it easy for each and all. May make it easy for all. Well, there is a suffering, and then these people, because of that suffering, they can't see the light. They can't see. There's just too much, and the the answer is right there in front of them all along. <laughs> Allah, it is just about istaslim. Let go. Surrender. The pain will stop. Allah. See, that's, it's always been right there. It's always. The help has been aqrab ilayna min hablil warid. Closer to us than the jugular vein. But we're too caught up in our webs. But yeah, let's... Mufti Saab, can you give a big, big up for Pakistan cricket team semi-finals? All right! <laughs> this, uh, yeah, inshallah, they're going to do it. So this is it. <laughs> Pakistan, Zindava. All right. You know what? It really play, it needs that song of uh, what is it? What's Junoon? They did the best one ever. The cover for any that should be the Pakistani anthem. <laughs> you know that? What is it? That Pechan Kabhi Na Bhulo. That 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 is the best. I have to say ever track I've heard. Uh, that is. Patriotic for Pakistan, as in he's speaking about Pakistan. Um, it should definitely be taken up as the anthem. <laughs> ah, right. So let's, people, let's move on to the discussion of all right, Jordan Peterson and Mustafa Akyal. Muhammad. Iman, mashallah, Mufti, you've become a Sufi. <laughs> Allah. I don't know if I'd call myself a Sufi, but this is the path, people, the path. Right, so there was a, a very needed discussion between Jordan Peterson and Mustafa Akyal on Islam, Christ, and liberty. So I watched this. Uh, I found it very interesting, I must say. I, I appreciated the fact that this discussion happened. I think there were many, um, um, many topics I would love for them to have factored into it. But naturally, obviously, time is sensitive and there's only so much they can discuss given a certain time frame. Now... So what they do is they begin the conversation. There's and those of you that haven't watched it, there's it's it's very amicable. There clearly seems to be a sense of dignified respect. And I think this I've really this is something I've really enjoyed. That there was a mutual flow, a bi-directional flow um, of uh, mutual uh, dignified respect and a reciprocity of acknowledging each other's opinions. I really, uh, I thought, wow, I, I liked that because I felt, you know, I'm not watching a debate. I'm not watching two people taking digs at each other. I'm watching two intelligent people have a conversation like two people would 
over a cup of coffee and really get into that conversation. You know where the real talk happens in life. <laughs> Allah. So, and you're watching it and they're going and they, they, hey, but what about this? And, you know, this is like this. And so I, I loved the, the dynamics were spot on. I think, uh, I don't know whether they knew each other before and that assisted in that. Um, maybe, but but that definitely is an absolute plus point. So, you know, absolute 10 out of 10 marks for the dynamism between themselves. The topics, I think, um, that were discussed mainly, they seem to uh, reflect um, Christology in the sense, how, how do Christology from a Muslim perspective, how do Muslims view Christ? And how do they get around the divinity aspect? Now, to be fair, that topic, I, 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 it's not necessarily something that gets my engine going. It's not something which I think is such a, an, you know, like an amazing topic for me as a person. So I, I found the topic. I'd probably give it something, mm, just maybe like about six out of ten the topic but i can understand why jordan peterson was doing it uh because he was trying to um bring a perspective which is the muslim perspective to his audience but then i suppose his audience are not necessarily christian although many are believers or maybe he feels that most of his audience are Christians. That's why he did this. But I didn't think most of Jordan Peterson's audience are, um, you know, like fervent Christian, whether they have a Christian name or not. Uh, so I don't know. Fair enough. I, I get it. That's why he did it. And that discussion, it involved things like uh, they spoke about um, the, the, the character of Christ within the Christian and then Muslim tradition. And I must say, I think uh, there were some difficult questions that were presented to Mustafa Akial on, um, you know, how do um, Muslims respond to things like Mustafa Akial himself actually presented that Muslims, the Quran affirms the Quranic um, rhetoric. It affirms Jesus as the word of God. And then this, obviously, it would intrigue anyone. So Jordan Peterson asks him that, how, how do you reconcile that? Because how do you differentiate between the word of God and divinity? And I think that's a very, it, it was a, it's a difficult topic, but it's a, it's a very intriguing discussion. I don't think Mustafa Akial gave that much time to it, to that particular discussion, maybe because of its nature that it's so complex. And it's incredibly um, difficult to, it's quite amorphous in it by its nature. It doesn't really have a shape to it. And trying to force it into a shape could obviously be uncomfortable even for, for, for any academic. So, yeah, he, d he does answer. He gives some, he says, well, look, this has always been vague, even for Muslims. And I, I thought, fair enough, that, that is true. Uh, he does highlight that um, that this, he, he gives one response, which I found very interesting. He says that some people interpret the word of God because Jesus embodied the, the revelation in the sense that he was the walking, talking revelation. Just as some person, like the Hadith says, that the Prophet وسلم, was the walking, talking Quran. That, you know, كان خلقه القرآن, as the Hadith states. That in some ways, that Jesus, he was the good news. Because what are the Gospels? The Gospels are, you know, really just incidents of what Jesus was doing. He's going here and he meets someone and he says this and he says that. And I thought, that's actually wow, you know, I really liked that the way he said that. That this word that has been given to God. What was interesting, he doesn't he didn't mention this part, is that many Mufassirin, including Ibn Ashur, the great Maliki legend, and my 
indirect teacher through Sheikh Sidi Khubza. I have an ijazah to his Quran and his teachings. But uh, Sheikh Ibn Ashur, the, the, grand, the grand mufti of the Malikiya in the 20th century, his tafsir, which is 30 volumes, he writes that this is um a this is a reflection of what is in the gospel of john he says that in the gospel of john it says in the beginning there was the word and the word was with god and the word was god but the word you know it, he says that this is it's echoing that um if i recall correct because he highlights not that you see now he doesn't go into it too much but he's highlighting that what the Quran is showing it's kind of welcoming Christians. And this is Ibn Ashur. And I believe actually even Fakhruddin al-Razi may highlight some of that as well. But the other simple explanation many Muslim Mufassirin give is that, oh, this was the command that as in B because he didn't have a, a father, those who take that view, which is the majority. So they say that this was the command, but then, you see, it, it, it raises more questions because then they also believe the same thing about Adam, but they don't call Adam the word of God. So why not? And then in that case, why don't they call the world the word of God? Because the world came into existence. And so it has, it. you see, nobody really seems to answer this question with a lot of substance. Uh, historically as well, there's a lot of... Um, it's quite amorphous, the whole thing. It's not structured. Um, yeah. I would also add to that. I mean, th they are saying it, but I would kind of also f funnel in there that, you see, this was to show that you can believe that Jesus is the word of God. You can believe that without embracing a divinity about him. And I think this was one of the reasons that the Qur'an was using this language towards the Christians, because it doesn't use this language for anyone else, not even for Adam. or So people saying, well, this is because he was created without a father or so on. They also believe that about Adam, but they don't say that. They, they don't refer to him as the word of God. Or, and the word of God is really a Christian theme, you know, this logos. And they see Jesus as this kind of embodiment. And what Mustafa, Dr. Mustafa uh, Akial does highlight is that it's how the Muslims also see the Quran as the word of God. So in some ways, it's like saying Jesus was the word of God. But Muslims don't worship the Quran. You see, Muslims don't, we don't bow down to the Quran and things like that in that sense. I mean, unless somebody is using it metaphorically as the command of God or the inspiration or the word. Of, but we don't worship the Quran. We worship God. So in many ways, what I would have also kind of um, um, kind of footnote uh, added as a footnote to that conversation is that you see the Quran was bringing to the, the, the foresight of Christians that come to a common word between us, you know, that, you know, come, the Quran is not, Islam is not against you. Many Christians, it's, it's interesting that many, so subject to many studies, many Christians have said that the only reason they are Christian is because of Christ. If Christ was not this figure, then they wouldn't see the appeal in Christianity. So keeping that sentiment in mind, the Quran is saying that, look, even if you want to call him the word of God, the Quran is calling him the word of God. But we don't worship him. We only worship God, you see? And I think even though it is left vague, but it's it's done like that with the purpose to extend that welcoming hand to these people who were the recipients of the Quran, who were kind of 
listening to the Quran, they could understand it, but they were Christians. And just to remind them that this is a continuation of the Abrahamic faith. So I think that discussion was really, I mean, it's a very complex discussion. Um, it was raised. Uh, I, Dr. Mustafa does answer it. He does give some of these points. It is difficult, so I don't know how much more he could have answered, but it could have had a bit more of a discussion to it. But I feel the problem is uh, people may think that, you know, oh, my God, we're treading in murky waters. You know, I, like they feel uncomfortable discussing it because they just don't, you know, they they just feel that I don't know because <laughs> cause everybody in the past has also been a bit, um, you know, they've not, it not left a coherent statement. They've said many different things, but it's not really coherent. Every answer leaves more questions unanswered. So yeah, so there was that part. Um, there was, um, he is, um, Dr. Uh, Akial, he does say that the Quran uh, highlights the character of Jesus, the character of Mary, these personalities, uh, highlights them very specifically, emphasizes them, um, which unquestionably is true. And he also does highlight that maybe in many ways it's better to juxtapose Islam to Judaism than it is to Christianity because there's many more similarities between Islam and Judaism than there are between Islam and Christianity, although there are similarities between Islam and Christianity too. And I thought that was a, a very interesting and uh, a very interesting point that definitely rings true on many um, in, on many instances. So I see what he's saying and he and he highlights that the Prophet Moses, Musa alayhi salam, is the most prominent um, personality and character that is mentioned in the Quran, alayhi salam. And I think, uh, yeah, that's true. You know, the Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, is definitely the most recurring prophet in the Quran who is spoken of. So, yeah, that was fascinating. And just highlighting that there is not just a Judeo-Christian tradition, but a, Jude uh, a Judeo-Christo-Islamic tradition. I thought that was really good. Then there was a lot of discussion uh, between the two about totalitarianism. Um, and that totalitarianism is really a problem. And it is independent of faith. So you could have, just as you have Chairman Mao, you've had Hitler, you've had Stalin, you've had these people in the 20th century. They are quite independent from religion, even if they did have a faith of some sort. But really, this is totalitarianism, you know, fledged out. So to highlight and attack religions based on that. So I thought that was a, 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 a you know, a wonderful point that's being reminded once again. There was the discussion, I, I'm glad they did tackle the point of uh, um, of the Prophet وسلم, and wars, because Jordan Peterson has in the past described the Prophet as a warlord. And I think that's, um, I think that's insensitive, okay, because, especially because I, I, I deem Jordan Peterson to be, you know, absolutely intelligent so intelligent i you know and so profound and i find him mesmerizing so for somebody of such high esteem to be in sense where you know because i know he has <laughs> much more than the capacity and understanding to be sensitive so when he speaks of um so when he's asked the question do you believe in god and then he will say, well, you know, I behave as though I like to behave as though somebody watching me would would think I believe in God or something like this. And and, you know, when he's asked certain questions, his common <laughs> reply will be like, well, that would take me 40 hours to unpack that. <laughs> so I just feel given all of that some kind of sensitivity is always you know just a uh, propriety but I, I i wouldn't it's not that i'm holding that against i i'm just saying you know for somebody who is very well versed and intelligent and sensitive about topics like the discussion of god and so that maybe it's just you know but anyway th i'm glad they brought that up and dr uh, Akial Mustafa Akial does reply. He does highlight that. Look, um, 
um, he says that that the prophet's battles were defensive, which is absolutely the point. I mean, nobody really disagrees with that. The prophet's battles in Islam were defensive. They were not offensive battles. And the one or two are the history that comes with them are preemptive defense battles. So the prophet hears that such and such armies are getting ready. And if we don't act, we're going to be attacked here. So why don't we go out to a certain point and await them there? Like Ghazwa to Muta, for example, one of the final battles. So this is, it is as a preemptive, um, uh, preemptive um, expedition where they go to a place and await, but it is still in defense. Now, this is sometimes not known, or sometimes it's maybe it's known, but not given much attention. So Dr. Mustafa does highlight that, and I'm glad he does. He, he quotes the verses. I'm glad he quotes the verses that look at the first verse of Jihad. That permission has been granted to those who are oppressed, that they now may take up arms. And that was after over a decade of persecution. So I'm glad he highlighted that because that was really well done. And um, he then, you see, he, he, right, okay. So after that, Dr. Mustafa Akial highlights that you see the companions after the Prophet take on this expansionism um, idea and really all the offensive jihad begins with them. You see, I would disagree personally. Um, I would, you see, to me, Islam is not a pacifist faith. It has a military element to it. But then, you know, many mechanisms and do in the world, just as nation states today do. I mean, we wouldn't, you wouldn't picture a state today without its capacity for power. And in fact, you know, Dr. Peterson speaks, Jordan speaks about this a lot himself, that it's not... You see, it's the capacity, he speaks about it's the capacity to be a monster, but choose not to. That is the empowering element. And it's not the fact that you don't have a choice, that you, you couldn't be a monster even if you wanted to. Because <laughs> then you're just harmless. And nobody cares, you see. It's, it's the potential. And it's not, Islam has never denied that potential. But it's not this, it's not, been an aggressive, this kind of um, violator that in that some people have drawn caricatured Islam to be. Now, the companions after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like beginning with uh, Abu Bakr, beginning with Umar, uh, it's not. You know, if you study the history, it's not. Yes, there are. Um, it, it, it is. There's a lot of military expeditions taking place, but it's not like that, hey, everybody's living nice and peaceful. They're just having picnics and the Muslim armies are coming in. Oh, let's go on horseback and oh, let's throw spears at these people. And it's nothing like that. Nothing. I mean, in a worker's time, which is a very short span, just over two years, it's the internal tribes of Arabia that are kind of declaring themselves and, and trying to rebel and create insurgencies. And Abu Bakr is faced with the challenge of how do I suppress insurgencies? How do I? And I can only do it by showing, by meeting might with might. But in Umar radiallahu anhu's time, there is this, uh, this expansion takes place. But where it takes place, into the Middle East, into the Levant region. But that region has been bubbling with war for decades before Islam. You know, you've had the Ghassanids and the Lahmids and who are the Arab tribes constantly fighting. And constantly, and it wasn't just, because remember, many of these factions have tribes within Arabia, neighboring the Hejaz. 
within tihama, within nudge, you're going to have kinder that are based here and kinder that are based up there. And you're going to have many of the, uh, Rabi'a that are based here and Rabi'a that are based up there and Diyaru Bakr that are based up in the north, but also have, you know, many other uh, uh, factions in within Hijaz. It's not this, you see, the fighting has been going on long before Islam. Harb al is going on for 40 years prior to Islam. You know, this is not uh, something which uh, which we've covered in our things that you're going to have that, you know, Taghlib and, and the whole thing of Zir Salim uh, avenging, you know, and the whole thing about the statement, <laughs> it became a proverb that Banu Taghlib la Tughlab. You know, Taghlib la Tughlab. Nobody can overcome Taghlib. Because they're just this ruthless, bloodthirsty, and the famous proverb that lowl al Islam, la akalat la akalat taghlib al Arab, la akalat al Arab taghlib. That, uh, oh sorry, putting it the other way, that if it was not for Islam, that taghlib would have consumed and eaten up all of the Arabs. So it's not that. You see, fighting, it's a very volatile region, but two great dynasties are have kind of collapsed, or they are coming to their collapse, the, the brink. So the, the Rome has really lost its prestige, long lost it. And Persia has really it's 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 in its final breaths, you see. And those kingdoms are also, the Arab client kingdoms are also decimated because in uh, around the time of the Hijra, that what you have is uh, Nu'man ibn al-Munthir. You know, the great last Lakhmid king is, is killed because he, he insults the, the Kisra, you know, the king of Persia, for not allowing his, uh, his sister to be married off because he asks, he proposes, and in his famous statement that, don't you have any cows of the Persia? <laughs> says, are there no more <laughs> cows left in Persia for you to marry that you now need to look at the Arabs? And this obviously enrages Kisra, and he has him assassinated, and this then, uh, it destabilizes the Lakhmid dynasty, which then it becomes a power grab. So, and 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 they've got places in Bahrain. And so what I'm trying to sh state here is it's not, there's a lot of guerrilla warfare taking place, what they would call the Ghazwa. There's a lot of these Ghazawat. And it's not like this picture that, oh, there's a civilized society. Like, let's just say, You've got Europe today, you know, there isn't really a war taking place. And all of a sudden, the Muslims just suddenly one day with daybreak, you see these armies coming and, and they're throwing spears and they take off. It was nothing like that. So, yes, expansion continued, but it wasn't in this kind of bloodthirsty sense. It was, given the context, its natural kind of habitat. It was a very volatile war struck um, land, the Near East. And this is why they don't seem to keep going. You see, once those volatile regions are stabilized, the Muslims don't seem to keep going. They could have kept going. They don't. They just take, have truce. And it's not that they didn't have armies or they lacked the zeal. So I just felt that part I didn't, mm, I felt was a bit, uh, I don't know, me as a person, I didn't really um, agree so much with the thought that as soon as the companions came in, it turned into some kind of, uh, um, I do agree that obviously with dynasts and dynasties, there was a lot more expansionism, but but that too, even the, the Bani Umayya and even the Bani Abbas, they're not this kind of... Uh, they roughly just stabilize. They don't keep this kind of, there's some little battles here and there, but they're not this kingdom that is out on this, you know, this this kind of witch hunt for infidels and, and doing this. They're not at all. So that, so, but bringing that in anyway, so that was an interesting part of the conversation. And so overall, 
there was a bit of a talk about Wahhabis and Wahhabis, why the Wahhabis have got the upper hand today because of the petrol dollars. And um, uh, yeah, so th that's definitely a truth that Wahhabism has obviously spread because of what it has. But people, you know, it is what it is, but it's definitely politics. And I think MBS has changed a lot of that in Saudi Arabia, which uh, is something good that MBS has done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful because, you know, it's really all the dean ought to really be about the human connection. It ought to be about love. It ought to be about that compassion. And you see where classical Wahhabism was coming from, that's never going to happen because it's just coming from a place of just zealotry. And, and it's not, you know, it's just, and the fact that MBS has kind of neutralized a bit of that, uh, or a lot of it is, I think, very, you know, that's at least something good. So that part was discussed, how the West is not innocent and how they've played a role in the spread of this kind of ideology by supporting Saudi Arabia, by doing... So this was overall, I think it was a, a, it was a, it was a great discussion. I wish they had discussed other parts, but but the fact that the dialogue has now begun, that was the most important thing. And I think... Uh, um, if Jordan Peterson, I hope he continues this with other Muslims, and definitely I hope he brings on Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. I heard, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf kind of, I heard, Allahu Alam, that he cancelled it because he was getting too much pressure from the Muslims, which I think, come on, for the love of God, <laughs> don't let people dictate your. You know, something like this because it's a dialogue. It's something so beneficial. I, um, I don't think shying away just because some people are don't like Jordan Peterson, for example. Um, but the, I heard this. Allahu alam. That was the reason Hamza Yusuf backed out. I've heard now Muhammad Hijab has had a dialogue with him. I'm glad. I mean, I think you know, have he needs to have a dialogue with many people and just keep them going. And then, of course, when <laughs> then, of course. He needs to uh, allow a mind trap discussion when the time comes. I, I think it would be an amazing discussion to 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 have that out with uh, Jordan Peterson just to discuss because I think what he has done is he has restored confidence in people to believe in God. He has made it okay for you to be a believer. And I don't think, you know, I don't know if people agree with me, but really I feel he is one of the key people of the 21st century to have done that. I don't know of any person that has done that other than him in, in our lifetime. That is non-Muslim. Because, you know, Muslims don't count on the international uh, philosophical scale. They don't, unfortunately. So when atheists and scientists and this and that, because Muslims are still, you know, developing, they're not quite, so they don't count on that discussion. So in recent years, and definitely in the last decade and two decades, um, it has definitely been very unfashionable to believe in God. And it's almost become, it had almost become embarrassing for a person to say that they believed in God. And I don't mean by this Muslims. Muslims can say it, but the greater society, you see, the majority of the world is not Muslim. You have to understand that. The majority of the world is non-Muslim. OK, so many people had become embarrassed, especially in intellectuals, especially philosophers, especially thinkers, scientists, um, you know, leaders. They had become embarrassed to say that they believe in God because the the crackdown by especially the, you know, neo atheism, um, the militant atheism by the four, you know, the horsemen as they call themselves, you know, people like Hitchens. I, I mean, I adore Hitchens for, for his tenacity and his his thing. People like Sam Harris, people like these people, Richard Dawkins, these people, and I suppose to some extent Dan Dennett, these people following on from the likes of Carl Sagan, they obviously are great thinkers, great thinkers. And I absolutely, you know, uh, I applaud their thinking that, that these people are profound minds. But they had really hammered in this thought that it is absurd to believe in a God. 
and that you know science is the solution and anybody that's trying to even raise their head to science doesn't have a chance you know they and and that's true there was nobody uh, in the that could speak internationally that could bring any sense of dignity to the concept of faith in a sec on the secular sphere. I don't mean within Muslim circles or Muslim scholars. Muslim scholars to Muslim, obviously Muslims are Muslims. They really believe in God. So, but on the international scale where most people are not Muslim and most scientists are not Muslim and most thinkers are, you know, from the technological kind of breakthroughs and all these things going on in the world are not Muslim. So they do, they found it embarrassing to believe in God or to say that I believe in God. And Jordan Peterson, I feel, changed that. He, he really brought about a dialogue that meant, hmm, actually, you know, he was the Abu walid al-Baji to Ibn Hazm. <laughs> I have to say, he was the kind of, the, the kind of showstopper for atheism, that he kind of made them, this is in my uh, my thoughts, so this is why I rate him so highly. Obviously, I understand a lot of people don't like him as well, and each is entitled to their own. But so overall, I'm really grateful for the thing, and I thought I'd give it an overview and a review. So people, let's move on to your questions. I'll also share the link if anyone wants to jump on, we can, do that and and then we can wrap up i'll get the link uh, all right we got it I'm sharing in the chat you can see it okay it's gone all right there's the link people off the i got a question go if you study the quran 300 because that proof exists for one second just imagine god created us and then Yeah, there are a lot of thinkers who are religious out there too. Absolutely. So just look, I'm not saying there many people don't believe in God. They do, but they became embarrassed to openly acknowledge. So, for example, politicians wouldn't openly acknowledge. I suppose in some places, actually, that's the opposite with politicians. But generally, I suppose in there's there's many on the yeah. Especially, I'm speaking in internationally, okay, and people who speak English and people who are not Muslim, okay, most people may believe in God, and but they felt really hammered by atheism. And anybody who's been following that would understand what I'm saying. I mean, I'd been following it for years, for, for over a decade, and I could see it. I could see it in dialogues. I could see it in in discussions i could see the nobody was a match for these people nobody i i have not felt a single person handled sam harris the way jordan peterson did not a single person i've seen you know sam harris till date he you know i'm not i'm not saying you see you could still think oh this person won in your mind but if the public generally would think mm, you know, because they, they, cause they, they're good at what they do. Let's just be honest. They're good at what they do. And, but Jordan Peterson just changed the game. <laughs> Allah. And I love what he did. You see, he brought in philosophy, psychology. He brought in literature. He brought in archetypes. He brought in the subconscious mind. He brought in consciousness. You see, people, I remember Deepak Chopra trying to speak with Sam Harris about consciousness. And <laughs> and Deepak Chopra is good on that. But still, you know, it's it's hard. You needed somebody that was incredibly eloquent and effective with their words and that could back it up with studies. And that's what, what happened there. Cool. Uh, right. OK, I think we've got some. Sure, people, Some somebody said they don't think people were embarrassed. Fair enough. I mean, maybe they weren't. I mean, this is just my subjective, uh, you know, my subjective take from how I felt that people were. But maybe you feel that, no, people weren't really 
embarrassed. Maybe you feel that Jordan Peterson didn't really do anything. Maybe you feel that it's absolutely fine. This is just an opinion. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's not the word of God. <laughs> this is just me saying this is how I saw it. Maybe I'm I didn't see certain things and maybe I was blind to many others. So okay, right, let me we've got Matt. Matt is All right. Hey. How's it going? I can't hear you. One moment, can um let me just check that my thing is working. Is it me or I'll just go into audio, just check. Right, just one second. I think it might be my earphone. So just one second. I'm just going to connect that back up. It might be that it needed reconnecting. Just a second whilst I do that, people. Okay, that's hopefully connected. Hello, hello. Uh, can you hear me now? All right, I can. Matt, bienvenidos, welcome. How are you going? Doing well. Where are you from? Uh, sorry? Where are you joining us from? Uh, Brisbane, Australia. I just wanted to say wow. I've actually been a, um, uh, been a fan of your content for a while. We, we don't agree on everything, but I, um, sure. I really enjoy the way that you put po uh, points across and uh, the personality wow. you bring. Um, I think that you're definitely someone that brings a lot of positivity to the world in general. So, um, I, yeah. Well, uh, thank I'm you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I'm an atheist myself, but um, okay. I was actually kind of wondering, uh, like, for yourself, what it is that you find convinces you of the existence of God. Mm. Or I can say Allah if you prefer. I sure. Allah, no, no, really no, 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 God. No, God. God is absolutely <clears throat> God. Huh? It's not <laughs> whatever name we call him by. So, right. If I was to say the defining thing mm -hmm. that really um, that makes that gives me a sense of certainty that God exists, it is truly consciousness. Right. I feel that um, you see the the profundity of consciousness it transcends um not only any understanding but any simple materialness of this world and if that exists to me it it definitely guides us back to to the transcendent to the divine mm. yeah so because it's just it's not you see because it's so profound just you know it's like we are, it's like the lights are on. Yeah, it's yeah. like we are online. It's yeah. like animals are like all, let's say, because I suppose consciousness can be a kind of spectrum. So, you know, there's some, there's obviously there's awareness. It's difficult to also, it's like one of those things like love. It's difficult to kind of absolutely pin down, but we get, an, we know what we're talking about, but it's difficult to always put into words. Um, now, there's some kind of consciousness, if we're saying an awareness, a reflexivity, you know, at a plant level, at, uh, within nature, and then animal kingdom, and and it's kind of rising. But th then it comes to a point where it's all of a sudden, it's like it's online. And I, and I like that analogy that some people use for it, this online, offline kind of uh, um, metaphor. And so, and and it's just something so... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get it. It's a, it doesn't have to um, lead someone to God necessarily, but I, I feel it's difficult not to if one follows the path of consciousness. Yeah, no, I, I can kind of understand that view. Like, it's um, like consciousness is something which is uh, very different to everything else. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, but <laughs> it is something, and the, <laughs> yeah. If, if if we did have like a fairly good understanding of how consciousness mm -hmm. can arise, like materialistically, though, 
do you think that would be something that would sway you in your views or is it maybe something that is uh, maybe deeper or more important than consciousness or it, like... you see you see you see this thing that if we did have something that is let's say th this 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 question if we did have a more detailed explanation explanation of consciousness yeah you see i it's not that if we did have i cuz i am you see to me it's a certainty like it's almost a certainty i could say that that this consciousness is not it's i understand what if we could explain how it happens you see but that's that would be the whole thing in and of itself because that the the, the kind of offset to that question is coming from a perspective that to me it's it's kind of missing the grandeur of life it wouldn't mm. be that way it, you would never be able to explain it in that way because to me and i feel that many physicists may uh, be exploring this direction as well especially bernard bernard carr is and i mean he's uh, an associate was an associate of stephen hawkins and that consciousness is actually within the cosmos and that it's perhaps what joins he feels m theory with the multiverse theory that the missing m being mind that according to string theory you see even gravitation, I mean, gravity, uh, as posited by string theorists, it's something that is possibly going through dimensions. Hence, it's such a strong, such a weak force, because the weak force of gravity is still quite inexplicable. Like, we can't understand exactly why gravity is a weak force. Um, and, and one explanation... Do you mean a weak force within this dimension, or do you mean a weak force? Like, do you mean that it... Because it is actually quite dimensions because it's a weak force, or because it's go through multiple dimensions, so, it's a weak force within this. So dimension. this that that's that is the response or the hypothesis of many string theorists that it's possibly a weak force uh, because it's coming through diverse dimensions to us. I see. Yeah. But even okay, but even when you're looking at how we understand reality, so. You're just looking at reality yeah, to, as, as, as physics, science, as hard science understands it. So it yeah. understands it in this sense that there are at least 10, if not 11 dimensions to existence, um, which obviously we just can't understand already because it just, you know, it's already like, what the hell does that even mean? And yeah. then what we're saying is, well, at the essence of everything is most likely, I mean, it's just vibration. Yeah, it's just vibration of just being. We we don't yeah. know. Obviously, we're calling it a string, let's say, but it's just yeah. this vibration which is then giving rise to something, which is giving rise to some subatomic particle, which is giving rise to matter and so on. And obviously, the whole you know Higgs field and and then so on, all these different particles. But what we are saying, in essence, from physics, is that you, me, everything, for the most part, is just empty space. Yeah. Now that you see, even that it's something like we, no, none of us would really ever believe in that if it wasn't just a given statement in science, because it yeah. sounds so absurd. So yeah, I feel that, that when yeah. yeah, from an intuitive perspective, even even not even from an yeah from an intuitive, but even really like it's just because we know it to be true. Otherwise, we would really struggle to accept that really everything is for the most part just empty space it's mm. nothingness and and i feel that you know in that is a humbling truth that this nothingness is something that this and this is that if a person can accept that as they can on this level it guides to well wow you know, this profundity of it guides to the transcendent. Because even with life, you see, life now, obviously, one of the, you know, the elephant in the room is that life is obviously with DNA. But DNA is information. And thereby, its very essence requires the intelligibility of being. Which, obviously, well, the... 
I mean, yeah, well, because how would kind of you... like because uh, DNA is like it, it's kind of information. Like it's not like the same it sort is of information. information as yeah. Like it it is information, but it's kind of like um like let's say uh, water was flowing down a mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And as it's flowing down, it's coming across certain resistances as it flows down mm -hmm. the mountain. Yeah. Um, and so uh, eventually that flow of water will create a path or, you know, a stream it, um, as it goes down. And that, that's kind of similar to DNA in the way that it's... No, it's because you see, no, because the DNA is advising on how the proteins should be constructed. So it's yeah, actually that, telling, it's point. actually yeah. dictating, it's informing, uh, you, you know, the RNA and it's informing the, the my, it's actual information on what to do and what proteins to synthesize, which will then result yeah. in what kind of blocks. So it's not just a, it's not about an obstacle, it's an actual dictation. It's saying, do this. So yeah. this is, it's, it's coding. It's in essence, it's coding. So it's yeah. it's coding of any nature, whether it's you know coding on a computer. It's software in essence. Now they could be very simple software, very basic coding, at a very yeah. primordial sense of life, or they could be very complex coding, um, life as we know it today. But yeah. it it's the int uh, that's I'm not saying that this then. But I'm not saying a person has to see that and think, okay, there must be a god, you know. Yeah. What I'm saying is, yes, uh, it definitely brings that question like the elephant in the room that, wait a minute, if there is information, if the bit precedes the it, mm. right, as it's been put forward, as it's been posited in the theory, that the bit does seem to precede the it because it then dictates how the it is to be formed. So in that case, being with a capital B, has intelligibility to it. And this is obviously the whole thing of Tillich, speaking of the fact that being has intelligibility of it is indicative that there is, you know, that this is coming in with intelligence. Now, I understand it's not, you know, it's not like, a, it's not to say, well, you know, there will still be faith. There will always be faith. It's not to say, well, this is, you know, once a person hears this, they can only say, you know, anybody who says after <laughs> you can only go one way or the other. It's no, yeah. it's it's always be a question of faith. Yeah. Okay. But I do feel that that coming back to that also that voice, you know, building of consciousness, that voice within, these things yeah. are ultimately what guide people to this way, or to the path of, you know, leads in search of the divine. It's usually from one being aware, that consciousness, and then from that, this voice within us, because the, there is this kind of voice that we find within us, and, and it's just too real to be just random and mm. meaningless. So from within, and I'm not sure if this would be maybe your view, but like from the Islamic perspective, like obviously we can all see that there's a lot of different religions around the world. Yeah. And um, people from within those different faiths are going to have the same sort of inner voice that leads them in the guidance for their own religion. Yeah. Um, so is that more so maybe um, like... Like, because I, I know from the Islamic perspective, they believe that uh, that God sent messages messengers okay, yeah, across yeah. the world. So, do you think maybe that would be um, like again from the Islamic perspective, with the Quran yeah, being yeah. the completely unaltered version, like of the sure. mm -hmm. uh, wordings from God? Would that then maybe make the other religions essentially um, the older? Um, messages or the very messages, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, Islam <clears throat> generally, the, I mean, there's there's obviously there's as many interpretations as people, but many scholars always write as the Quran states itself that look that there's been uh, there's there's always been these prophets that have come to people, and they always come to a people that they are native to. Mm. 
And yeah. then God mentioned some examples in the Quran says we've only mentioned a few examples. There's so many we you know, we don't we have not mentioned them But yeah. there's been people in all times that have come now So yes, so, so I mean that's so many people have said many people have said that look for example uh, Buddha uh, you know, would have been a prophet um, according to Islamic teachings, that he would have been a prophet, uh, Zarast uh, uh, Zarathustra would have been a prophet, or uh, let's say Socrates was a prophet. These kind of discussions have happened uh, on many occasions in the Islamic literature in the past. Obviously, these people have long been, I mean, they're, you know, historical figures. So people are saying, well, when we look at their messages, this is what we see. We feel that that would have been a divine well, how people followed it and how it turned out obviously is something uh, that is up for debate, but they would feel that these people were divinely, some people would, I'm sure some people would say that, no, we don't think so, maybe not. And But there's always been that room to say, well, look, God has, that there's always been prophets of God that have been inspired in different places and have, um, and then spoken to their people. The, the issue of religion that, you know, there's so many different religions that you ask, of course. Yeah. Now, this is really the human journey. You yeah. see, it's not God's. It's you see, this is they will always be. You see, as human beings, it's not just human beings. It's nature. It's there will always be conflict. There will always be some kind of um, antagonism, some kind of competition um for the for, for for life in and of itself to thrive even with ideas they must compete for them to thrive you know yeah. this is it's it's at every scale it's at a, a, the human level it's at life you know just life in nature and it's at an ideological level with ideas as well with concepts that there's always this kind of that just seems to be the law of mm. Of, of things. So yes, people have, you know, people will say, well, oh, but religions disagree in themselves. Um, I would feel that in essence, many religions ultimately, in essence, essence, the, the kind of core of them, the nectar of them, would be saying very similar things. Obviously, the, the kind of layers around them become different. Um, and that may be in part with culture, it may be in part with where they are in the world and what they, so for example, some religions, one of the key divergence that you study in, in uh, philosophy of religion is it's either what they call, I mean, some have termed it Eastern the Eastern religions versus Western religions. Some call it, you, you could simply call it the Abrahamic faiths or, you know, the, but then it doesn't contrast it with something. So the East West that is often given, is those religions that uh, relied upon reason to to like they definitely embodied reason whether they always followed it through is a question for debate but they at least asserted that they were built on on reason now versus those that were built entirely on the absurd or and by absurd i don't mean something being silly but the concept of the, the philosophical absurd that it was yeah. never about making sense it was about just the experiential and it was never to make sense so you know things like the the like, that would be buddhism hinduism that kind of uh that that group of um beliefs where it will say things like things are not what they seem nor are they otherwise now that in and of itself, even though it's you've understood the words, but what am I even saying? It's Speaking but it's about levels. exactly, and it's about embracing that philosophical absurd, and yeah. it's not about reason. So even from this split, it's about maybe what civilizations needed at a certain time. You see, yeah. I would feel that the ancient civilizations in the Far East that they, at a certain time, it was about the mystique. It was about purely about that, the philosophical absurd. But what happens is humanity is at a certain point in, in human history to be where religion is to be rooted in reason. And this obviously begins with the whole Judeo-Christian and then Islamic traditions that then set humanity onto a trajectory for unification. Because I definitely feel that the, the three greatest things that have set humanity on 
to this unification uh, trajectory have been, as Yuval Harari highlights, that they've been, uh, it has been religion, it has been empire, and it has been uh, currency. I mean, these things have ultimately kind of unified uh, humanity, and, and maybe we're, we're heading towards a greater unity yet. You know, yeah. In time to come. Do you yeah. think with, with the, the inner voice you were speaking of before mm. and with the other religions potentially all having levels of inspiration, like, um, I guess even, even when it comes to, though, considering, like, uh, from people who are similar to myself who don't hold an active belief in any, um, you know, gods or spirituality, like, um, I guess that probably, I, I don't know your view, but um, maybe that wouldn't be exclusionary to having the inner voice, but um, then that would likely preclude um, the inner voice being from having the messenger and would just be like, I'm just trying to guess from your view would be, that's just the yeah, sign of- Yeah, I'm saying that there these something. are, you see, there are many things um, along this journey that, you know, we, 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 this journey of life, there are many things that will be, that are symbols of the transcendent, of the divine. Um, now, they, they may be there as an aid. They may be there to, to guide. They may be there and may be ignored. So this, so for example, an inner voice, uh, for example, creation in and of itself, as as Immanuel Kant would say, you know, the, the starry heavens above or the moral code within, um, whether it's going to be consciousness, whether it's going to be other intricacies. So, for example, the question that mathematicians have raised, that it's interesting that, uh, you see, is this world a simulation that, the, you know, in, in the simulation theory that what they've said that, OK, is it? If so, let's work it backwards. That mm. if it were to be a simulation, what would you expect to find? Like, yeah. what could you catch out? Now, according to that hypothesis, the things that they would expect, they seem to be finding. And hence it's, it's so they seem to be finding the because you'd expect certain coding in the cosmos and certain forces to behave in a certain way and certain mathematical patterns to be in certain things. And they seem to be finding, I mean, you could just watch several, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a, a, a lot of uh, panel conferences on it. They're on YouTube with mathematicians giving lengthy kind of presentations on it. So you would, if you just, you can watch that. I, I In fact, everybody should watch. It's very interesting. So mm. you see, there are many signs or symbols. I, I, I would say symbols. I, I prefer that word or signs or whatever. And they're all there. And yeah. maybe some help others more than others. Maybe some don't help at all. Maybe it's but one thing for sure. It is a very personal journey. Um, people to some people through things like mindfulness, through exploration, they have experienced certain planes and of consciousness that are undeniable to them. Um, you know, th some people through, uh, through other measures, have experienced that. Whether it's, in fact, there's a documentary. I'll I'll speak about it on maybe next week. Um, through some of these, the sacred medicines, for example, uh, things. There's a documentary called Five Meo the Movie, and mm. even though the, the documentary isn't necessarily, um, it's not hyping. And uh, the it's just a documentary about three friends who set off to to explore this and and it's just following their journey. But it's not necessarily speaking in favor of sacred medicine, such as these psychedelics like 5-MEO. But it's uh, it, at the same time, it's not negating it. It's just kind of leaving it for the viewer. Now, it's very interesting that these ancient traditions as well that go back thousands of years. Um, as with other traditions that have done this through meditation or mindfulness or uh, within the Muslim tradition as well, certain people with dhikr and this kind of, you see, it's interesting because dhikr can mean uttering, remembering, but it can also mean mindful, this mindfulness. And that people, they actually experience. Um, and, and what they experience is, obviously it's subjective, but it's, you see, it's more real than real. And for that person, it becomes 
impossible to deny what they have experienced. And I know to the mm. other that, that they haven't experienced it. So they see that, you know, mm, well, this is just your experience. You could be hallucinating. You could be this, you could be that. And true, that's to the other until they taste it. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, yeah. Do you think though, if, <clears throat> so if people are having these different experiences, like, um, is that, like, I understand how convincing it is to the person who has the experience, but yeah. um, a lot of the experiences people have are very different to one another. Um, like, there's not that level of consistency of, you know, what but they what, went what, through, which... I've why would we seek out... You see, we shouldn't be... It is all about the individual person and their journey. It is not to mirror or to replicate or to clone another i mean obviously you have pathways you will have structures you will have societies you will have you know you will have faith guidelines you will have religions that are guiding you but your experience is is your very own and it's for yeah. yours to cherish yeah yeah I, I definitely agree that like um i mean if everyone is just having the same experience it would be less of a, a special thing to do but <laughs> Um, like the, the reason yeah. I asked that though is like for, yeah. um, like generally in at least, you know, um, well, most of the world th these days generally follows, uh, the scientific method for yeah. coming to terms with, you know, what is, uh, you know, an accurate description of how reality works. Um, and so yeah. when we look but at I, having, but, but I've given that and we, we don't really truly believe in it in our real world, but we believe in it in a textbook version. See, like I told you, we, you and I are for the most part, not even here. And yeah, you see now, really that speaking, here completely here though. <laughs> like and the, that's the consciousness. Well, which once again, we know. have no idea where to begin with. <laughs> yeah. I, I think though, if we were to like, if we were to construct, um, uh, say um an actual replica of a human right mm -hmm. um with you know fully functioning cells and mm -hmm. all of that i imagine that more than likely that person would be conscious if we were to you know ensure it was like a, a living uh creation right well i i can well, i can but, tell you look scientifically <clears throat> speaking that wouldn't be true you know how because homo sapiens have long existed before the cognitive revolution the exact same Homo sapiens as us. I don't mean uh, Neanderthals or Heidelbergensis or these other variants. I'm speaking about Homo sapiens have gone yeah. back. So the ancient. So now we have at least Homo sapien findings from at least 300,000 years in certain parts of the world. Whereas we know that the cognitive revolution of consciousness must have taken place anything between 70 to 100,000 years. So if you were to find a dead body of a Homo sapien from, let's say, 150,000 years ago, he would look identical to a, let's say, given whatever the regional features of a human being today. You would not, like, let's say we clothed him, you would think that is an absolute, you wouldn't think he's a Neanderthal, you wouldn't have like a, a protruding brow or anything. He would look exactly like us. So, and he would have a brain just like ours, the same capacity, the same CC, you know, whether it's 1800 or whatever, the, he would be exactly like us, except he would not have consciousness. So what what is it that you mean by consciousness then? When you say now, we, isn't that the million dollar question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I don't really know what differentiates us from like a dolphin or an octopus, uh, yeah. for example, or, um, you know, any of the other apes. Um, we seem to have varying degrees of, you know, see, Matt, uh, that is where brain, but... that is where your journey begins, not just yours, each and all. And this is why I've said that in this day and age, it will be the path of consciousness that guides to the transcendent. In just trying to understand it, just try to spend the coming, whatever time you have in the future, ponder, reflect that what is consciousness? Why, why is it special? What, why, what is, you know, hominins have existed for so long. They're not just, and in fact, consciousness to a great extent is counter evolution. I mean, it's counterproductive evolutionarily speaking.
You see, because we are much better at survival based on instincts than we are on consciousness. Because consciousness causes you to pause. Whereas instinct, an animal will hunt on instinct. This is why it does what it does. It will hunt on how it's been built to hunt. If it had to think, you see, thinking weakens you because it can make you also think compassionately. It can make you slow you down. It can make you, you're not imp impulsively acting on instinct always. So it's not productive to evolution. Obviously, human beings have thrived because of consciousness, but it's not productive as far as evolution is concerned. Now, it just happens to be that, yes, we have taken it this way, yeah. but that's like a fluke. You know, it's not I, it, I don't, going by the... I, yeah. I definitely, like, challenge you on that because mm -hmm. instinct uh, alone doesn't seem to be what we... Okay. Um, I, 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 well, like, here, like, all you'd have to do to, ca to prove that, you'd just have to put a human being that is conscious in the wilderness on his own, and you'd have to put an animal. And you can place your bets, and I'll bet so much more money. Whatever you bet, I'll double it. And that the animal will outlive and outsurvive the human being. If he's on an island, brutal nature, you place a human being, and you place on a similar virtual thing, let's say a chimpanzee, or you place an animal. Now, the animal will out-survive the human because it doesn't, you see, the consciousness will freak the hell out of you. It will, it will give you so much panic. You see, it's not, you know, when you're built to just move and survive, that is all you're built for. You do not pause and reflect. And you, you see, as Mark Twain said, that I've been through many terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. Most of our fears are in there. Our fears are kind of our conscious, like we, we imagine them. People live in depression. Why, you know, in studies done on primates, primates that, for example, chimpanzees who are paralyzed don't undergo depression. They don't become depressed. They live just as happy. Why would a human being in that scenario become depressed? Because of consciousness. Because he becomes conscious and he thinks of the future. And he thinks that, well, you know, I'm going to live a miserable life. I won't be able to do what that. Whereas the chimpanzee in the studies with bonobos, they showed that they there was no varying degree to their subjective well-being. They remain just as happy and they remain just as playful and joyous, regardless of becoming crippled. You see, human beings, when you say does consciousness in br brutal nature, the fact that we society, you see, the way it's happened is it's won. Consciousness has won the war and humans have thrived. Now, you and I are, are living in that society where humans have thrived. So therefore, it's true we would now think consciousness, but given just, if you're just playing a game of chance, you see, it's, if, nature if, is brutal. Do you know the marshmallow experiment that um, okay. they perform on children to see, um, like to basically demonstrate their ability for foresight and um, yeah. suppressing the desire for something now so that they can get something? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so would you it's, say it's, that it's good that you mentioned that because do you know the studies showed that bonobo chimps when given the same study with withheld for the same amount of time as children which was the maximum 18 minutes now they showed that so bonobo had the same ex could exercise the same amount of self restraint as a child yeah. could to refrain for a greater reward but not longer than 18 minutes however the bonobo outsmarted the child <laughs> when it came to mirroring on certain things. When, so, for example, when they gave them, there were certain experiments where the child had to do something and they would get certain rewards and sometimes it was randomized and you couldn't see how it was happening, but some had transparent kind of backing. So you could see the hand of the experimenter doing something. So you could tell, oh, he's doing this, so this is not going to happen this time because you could see the yeah. hand. Yeah. The, the, the bonobos, when they could see the hand, didn't they, they, they recognized it. And they could tell that, oh, this isn't going to happen, whereas the child still couldn't. So yeah. the bonobo chimpanzees uh, could outperform the intelligence of a young human child. But yeah. it's only as we develop that we become obviously much more intricate and sophisticated. Yeah. But do you think that that would be based on instinct 
then because if it's performed outside of the you know like normally i would say instinct would generally be something for you you know like um it would be described as um something which creates an impulse to act you know, right yeah so away. okay so just so, so just to that's a good question just to kind of as a notation to clarify that so although i'm using the word instinct because i don't you know for lack of a better term that's just me i don't mean by just purely impulsive instincts what i mean is you see the animals have a brain as well so yeah. they they have all the, the these kind of systems they have flight fight they have obviously the sensory motor sensory cortex they have all these visual cortex they have all the auditory cortex they have these things as well and obviously chimpanzees similar to some extent to humans obviously not as developed in the prefrontal cortex but still similar now mm -hmm. it's not i don't mean by that they're just surviving based on a whim that it's just yeah. like an instinct to react obviously there are some deep mechanisms so even primates and animals and even certain mammals have some concept of justice for example and morals and this you know um franz de Waal speaks about this in his book the bonobo and the atheist he highlights yeah. after decades of studies that look they have certain structures and they have a community concern and they they recognize structures they recognize hierarchies they also recognize some form of right and wrong they recognize punishments and they recognize these things there's obviously a sophisticated kind of um mechanism at play but they're not and and so Obviously, they are conscious. If it depends how, if we're speaking about consciousness as a spectrum, then they are conscious, but they're not. You see, we are at a point where we are online, yeah, and they so are still offline. Of consciousness, rather but than it's, just the you see, it's of just that conscious. No, it's just that consciousness. When we're using it in binary terms to say we have consciousness and animals don't, we're not using it in that sense, in the spectrum sense, because it's like obviously life so when we speak of life obviously bacteria has life but we're not speaking you know when people say for example life is precious they're not in that particular context referring to bacteria or viruses or things like this that are also alive but they're referring to let's say human life or maybe animal mammal life or they're not even referring to reptilians or uh, or pests or you know so yes in one sense life is you know, it's a continuum starting right down from single cells all the way up. Yeah. But when we're speaking in a certain setting, we're speaking. So when I'm saying consciousness, I'm speaking about consciousness as we recognize it, the precious, the question mark consciousness. But you're right. If we're speaking as a spectrum of awareness and some form of consciousness, then a lower level consciousness is there amongst animals and more so amongst some than others, like obviously dolphins and elephants and um, obviously primates and even crows, you know, to some extent. So it is there, but it's still a very qualitatively different format. It's not like how we have it. So we have obviously something, there's some kind of, if I can say magic, <laughs> there's some kind of magical level do or makeover to human consciousness, uh, which is very different. Now, that's what I meant. I wasn't just speaking about sheer instincts that the animals are just kind of reactionary. And, but what I was saying is, you see, if the purpose of evolution is to survive, simply survive, then nature, which is brutal, can survive much better without consciousness being like our sense of consciousness, the magical consciousness being gifted, because nature is very brutal to... To, to be wired to survive is just the better way to do it. With humans, consciousness, obviously, we thrived in a totally different way. But I'm just saying, given the equation, it seems counterproductive to survival in brutal nature. Obviously, the way history worked out is humans did thrive. Mm. But yeah, I mean, these are obviously, to be fair, we can never settle these in just a discussion. But these are definitely fabulous points to ponder over. And it's obviously, look, it's a question which nobody can, you know, I could say, you know, I've experienced something that you, somebody else could say, you know, they've experienced the presence of God. They've experienced yeah. these things. Now, I get it to that person. It's well you know, they've experienced this thing. And so it's very it's yeah. more real than real. Somebody else could say, well, I haven't, you know, and 
in my mind, you know, that's just, it's subjective to you. Which, which, okay, is each person's journey. For all we know, for example, one could argue that none of you really exist. This is all just a dream in which you are just a figment of my imagination. Yeah. And, and you could say, well, that's not true because I exist, but you could just exist within that imagination. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't you, be able to demonstrate. You wouldn't be able to tell, exactly. Case, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's been epic, Matt. I, I love the philosophical. Is it, what is it you do, by the way? If you don't mind me. Uh, at the moment, I'm a student. Um, I mm. used to run a couple of businesses, but um, uh, some not so great things happened, and I decided for a career change. So, oh, maybe, maybe for science. maybe for much greater things to happen yet. Quite That's possibly. <laughs> Allah, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, Matt, I really appreciate. I, I appreciate, you, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate yeah. the the dialogue. Take care, and I'm sure we'll speak soon. Stay in touch. Much love. Yeah. Thanks Over again. And and thanks for uh, okay. the positivity you um you bring across. Um, yeah, I see when you post the shorts. On, um, <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate. Always, that. I always click them to have a look. So. Thank uh, you. And um, sorry to hear. I know it was a while ago now, but sorry to hear about the um oh. when the people came and. Geez, yeah. House you know, it's all. Was... Even 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 crises have within them hidden blessings. And many yeah. a blessing emerged following that. So thank you once again. I appreciate it. Take very good care of yourself. And we'll speak soon. People, My ladies and gentlemen, best. that was Matt from Down Under. All right. Very interesting discussions there. Quite a, quite a few. We went from some very complex topics to more complex topics. Get carried away. This is my, you see, once I get talking... <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely one of those people that, you know, I saw this meme where it said, uh, I mean, this is obviously with all uh, Matt's discussions was so engaging, but I'm saying besides that, I'm one of those people. I saw this meme where it said that somebody sitting in there's a chair and it said, please do not talk to me because I have the, <laughs> it said, because I'm unable to stop myself and I'll just talk for hours and get no work done. <laughs> that's what i'm like so okay who have we got here people uh, we've got life is now life is now people i like the message ah assalamu alaikum hey assalamu alaikum how are you man alaikum salam i'm good all right who do we have where are you joining us from seattle washington um uh, i wanted to really thank you um because I think you did a little video a while back about not killing ex-Muslims. And I was really thinking about it because um, actually I was an ex-Muslim for about eight or nine years until like maybe September of this year. This and year? Yeah, yeah. Like literally like a, like a couple months back. Um, and it was just... Uh, like, I was just thinking that, you know, imagine if I had been killed and I wouldn't be having the sweetness of faith that I feel now. Like how, A, I wonder if Allah would have helped, held that person accountable for what I could have, what I'm experiencing now and not experience, not having experienced it, if you know what I mean. And, and B, no. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, please carry on. Please carry and B, you know, imagine how, because my experience over the past two two months has been almost like, you know, a person who's been starved or is like um, dehydrated to a very extreme extent, finally finding an endless fountain of water and wow. just being able to drink from it and not being able to fathom what did he deserve to find this fountain of water, of this, this saving grace in a weird way. So anyway, may Allah, may Allah bless you, bless your journey. Uh, you know, your your words touch our hearts seriously, and they leave an imprint on our soul. It is, it's something. You know what you're saying. It's not even you. You're hypothesizing even at the, the the nth degree of saying killed, but even abuse, even verbal abuse. You know, these things are enough to really damage people oh, you know, yeah. the amount of people that go into clinical depression the amount of people that break down the the hatred the seeds of hatred that get sold just because 
you know, people react. We were also speaking with Matt, people react in, with that animal instinct as opposed to, you know, this, what God has gifted us. And, you know, just to hear that, wow, that not only your journey of faith, but your experience of finding it and, and how you feel, you know, may Allah bless you. And uh, it's an absolute honor to just hear you say that here on, on you know, live today. Well, so shukran. The shukran. reason why I feel so strongly is because I didn't seek faith this time around. It's like, a, like I think you, I think I saw a video of yours, you're like, the Maliki fiqh chose me. And uh, similarly, you know, it's I didn't like that. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I that is that is that is faith, you know. And even w when I was just speaking to Matt a moment ago, yeah. you see this this question that people say that look, I you know about the path, about this consciousness, about becoming aware, about God. You see, it will choose you. You know, when the time comes, there will be a calling. You know, I mentioned yeah. that inner voice. It will hear that calling regardless of whether you do or don't. And it's yeah. hard to explain this in because it's it has to, it's like taste. It's like how do you explain the taste of no, it's an such apple. a personal <laughs> and subjective experience that I can't tell the me from a year ago, even though I would have been, you know, 28 and still a very, you know, relatively able-minded person. Uh, I would have I would not have understood what I'm saying now. If and, I you, and, you, and you may have even, I don't know, may have even ridiculed. You may have. Oh, oh yeah. Know. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I remember a clear conversation that I had with my uncle a year ago. I, I told my family right away that, you know, I'd left Islam. Obviously, okay. being the Pakis that we are, you know, my mother, my uncle, they were all very devastated. Um, and but, you know, alhamdulillah, they never abandoned me, you know. Uh, because I was afraid they would like kick me out of the family and all this, but they're like, you're our kid. Anyway, my point is, so I, I remember a year ago, I, how boldly I said to my uncle, like, yeah, there's probably some sort of a, I'm a very naturalistic person in the sense that I love nature. If you like poetry, I think you might enjoy the poetry of John Muir. He's a okay. American naturalist um, whose poetry I adore because he explored the Western United States and how gorgeous these mountains are in the Western United States. Um, in any case, so I, I don't think I ever stopped believing in a greater power just because of how majestic and beautiful nature is. But at the same time, I remember telling my uncle a year ago, no, this book is probably just man-made and it's probably just sewn together, uh, you know, by either now it's been by the prophet or by people succeeded him and i and i i think back to that statement and i'm like how blindly that was and how proudly that was said mm -hmm. and so it's just wow you know I, I can't explain this is why it's so important you know somebody mentioned earlier on they said look oh um you know they, they were mentioning people oh you know people that are still involved in kind of attacking people in in kind of saying such and such person i mean verbally as in saying such and such people are deviants or such and such people are like this and so, and i and i was saying that look break that circle of toxicity you oh, know yeah. what like what i tell that? you what let's make dua for them i said you know because i said that the thing is that you see what can you imagine you see, you you were a year ago. You were at a particular place in your life on a journey, and you are somewhere today. It doesn't matter what somebody believes, what somebody they are on a journey. But where they may get to depends on how people treat them. Yeah. You see, you show is... someone love, you show them encouragement. Like you said, look, your family didn't yeah. disown you. Where would that have got you? Oh, I no, mean, it, not exactly. Yeah, no, that would have been terrible. And, you know, the funny part is I, uh, the, the whole reason I came back to Islam and I said I, I didn't choose to come back. I, I it was not it was like a, basically what happened is my uncle came to visit me from Pakistan and he stayed with me for a week and he brought me a masala or a giant namaz. Right. Yeah. And after he left, um, I was looking at the thing like a nuisance. And the so just sitting there in the corner of my room. I remember the feeling like, man, I have to get rid of this thing. So I called 
I even joked with my mom that I'm going to ship it to you and whatever happens on the way happens mm -hmm. because U.S. mail is notoriously unreliable sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, I was looking at this thing like a nuisance and I, since I always wake up very early just because I was a practicing pseudo practicing stoic, I love the stoic uh, thinkers like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. Um, so I, I woke up early and did my exercises, but I had this weird instinct to pray Fajr out of the blue, I, just by looking at this masala. And I was like, so I, I think I'm really glad I followed that instinct because I just, I had to Google, I had forgotten all of the, you know, the tasbih, the, you know, subhanak Allahumma. I had forgotten the tashahud. I had forgot, I barely remembered my fatha. And, and barely remember Surah Ikhlas. I, it was just, I had gone from a, I had been a very, like, in my mind, I think I was a very practicing Muslim before, but I think now that I look back, it may have been all the kathar or like the show of outward, you know, it's religiosity. Life. It's life. It's all part yeah. of that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in any case, it was just, that's what I mean, that it was an instinct that I didn't choose. It just came. And I'm really glad I followed it. And when I felt that in my broken prayer, because I had to Google and it was just a broken prayer, even that done with focus and sincerity was like the feeling I got, I had never experienced before. And alhamdulillah, I still experience it every time I pray now, if I do it properly. And I'm really afraid it will go away, but I'm glad it never does. It's amazing, man. That's amazing. And, you know, it's, it is, that is within you, okay? So just remember that, that that is your, and, and, and the prayer is always just something that brings you into that state of submission. It brings you into that connect. That's, yeah. that's, and, and just, yeah, man, I'm really glad. I'm really glad you shared this with us. I appreciate it. Uh, do stay in touch. You know, send me a a message on on Instagram. I'm gonna look out for your your post and look out for your messages. And inshallah, if there's you know, keep us keep us posted. I really I congratulate you again, and I'm just grateful. And I make dua that you shared this because it's not you see one is your I journey, share hope. which is yeah. I want to yeah. share hope. That's that, what you're doing. Yeah. It's I, I'm just looking at some of these talk the toxic cultures, the toxic brothers of in faith of mine, and I look at the things that they say and how they ridicule others and just ask them, just leave Islam, why don't you? Because you believe in something I don't. Or I whatever happened to La Ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah being okay, you're my brother and I'm gonna give you even if you don't say it, I still give you the respect look at that what human the prophet deserves. said. Dakhal al Jannah. Yeah. You know, he says yeah. that's it. La ilaha al You know, it's. So I want to share done. hope. Yeah. <laughs> I want to tell the people who are Muslim that, you know, if you see ex Muslims and they are ridiculing you, be gentle because I was there. And, every, you, know, you know, for everyone you meet is fighting a difficult battle. That be gentle. Yeah. It's, you know, these words, they're so valuable. I mean, that's from Plato, but it's so. It's so it's so valuable, but yeah, shukran once again, and you are doing that. You are giving hope, by the way. This, but just your, your beaming it. So you know, I'm. <laughs> that's it, man. Just keep it going, and um, do keep us posted with, with your with your journey. Okay, so shukran once again, and I'm sure anybody that's from Washington, they want to reach out and connect. I'm sure you can you can connect, and inshallah. Continue that journey. Take care of yourself. We'll speak soon. Shukran Inshallah. once again. Assalamu Thank alaykum. you for having me. People, that was Life Is Now, a really powerful message. Because, you know, so often we become so judgmental. I spoke just a few minutes ago about people trying to castigate, people trying to uh, outcast, to uh, excommunicate uh, and anathematize people from the faith, do takfir, you kafir, you deviant, you this, or this person is an ex-Muslim, or this person is a kafir, this person is a fasir, or this person is a, you know, uh, uh, just not a true Sunni, or not a... Hate 
never yields results. And the results it does yield are just very, I mean, they, 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 they are counterproductive to anything antithetical to the good cause. Keep that in mind that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his hadith, you know, if you can just take one hadith, take this one. It is, this was one of the first hadith I ever memorized. Um, my sheikh, who I have had on mind trap, Sheikh Sidi Iqbal, he's uh, one of the most renowned uh, scholars, especially within the Maliki method, within the English speaking world. And I was probably just about 17 and I used to go visit him and I used to learn Arabic from him. I was, a, I have to say, a lazy student <laughs> at that time. And, and he had this, you know, this beautiful frame in his house, you know, absolutely stunning, beautiful calligraphy. And I, I used to, what does it say? I couldn't, <laughs> because of the calligraphy. And, and it used to, and it would say, and he read it for me and he said, it says, Yassiru. And I memorized it then. And that has been one of the, the cornerstones of my faith. It is a Sahih Hadith. It is that the Prophet said, make ease for people. Do not create difficulty for them. Always invite people. Never scare them away. And that is really the Prophet's character. If you had to sum it up in a Hadith, that is the Hadith. So memorize that if you can. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Bashiru wa la tu'nafiru. Okay. Let's see who we've got here today. We've got uh, Sean Sheikh. Sean Sheikh. Let me add you to the stream. Assalamu alaikum, Sean Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti Sahib. Can you hear me all right? I can. Where are you joining us from, Sean? Uh, I'm uh, in Canada, about an hour away from Toronto. Wow. All right. Got to say, you you had us with the name there. We're trying to think, Sean. All right. I like it. Cool name. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm Pakistani background. And uh, like, so the, the Urdu version of that was like the, the Sheen Alif Noon, you know, like some Pakistani actors, Sean. Sean. Oh, Sean. this is your real name, Sean. I thought yeah, you yeah, just yeah. put it there as a. No, no, no. No, no. way. Yeah, so Sean Sheen Alif Noon is that's like that. That would be like if it was in the Pakistani uh, legal documents. That's how it would no, be. You need, you need to do the whole Sean Michaels thing then. If, if that's your actual name, that because that's the only. When I think Sean, I think Sean Michaels, <laughs> the good old WWF days. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think my sister wanted me named after Sean Cassidy, and that was the spelling. Ah, that was uh, right. okay. Wow. But it's 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 because it's a little bit tricky because the the phoneme for the the Urdu sound with the alif ah, it's like it's a little bit of a you know it's a more relaxed one sure. than the ah, and it's yeah, sure. I don't I don't think you have an equivalent phoneme in uh, in English unless it's like it's like with a certain kind of mood like the when you mm. say the English a h, it's like ah. Right, as no. opposed to R. Uh, okay, Sean. Okay, sure. Sean. Well, it is. That's it. You're doing it. You're doing it, Sean. I like <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want this conversation to just be about my name. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Th thanks for taking the time. I know that you're you're running into about the three hour mark now. But uh, <laughs> yeah, w one thing, uh, one comment I want to make a little bit about the uh, the ex excellent. Uh, um, sort of a breakdown and discussion of the Jordan Peterson and Mustafa uh, oh, right. yeah, yeah, uh, sure. debate. Uh, I don't know if you caught it, but there was one uh, ayah of the Quran that uh, Mustafa referenced that uh, Jordan responded to very, uh, very, uh, very positively. Uh, I think. He Sorry, was... somebody just said, Sean does look like a wrestler. <laughs> you do, and it's Sean. Sorry, I could, to I could be. I could be. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was really into Hulk Hogan at one point. Yeah, yeah. When I was yeah. in Hulkamania, you know. But um, yeah, so I was saying the verse uh, uh, that I don't know if you caught uh, where Jordan responded that it was like a great verse. It was the Alazina uh, Yastamiun al Kol. Yastamiun al Kol. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing. I, I he really gave me a, a new way because he says that you see this whole thing of. Uh, that Yastamiun al Kol because the word in and of itself and how it. Uh, it, it is the empowering element, and they follow the best of it. And yeah, sorry, carry on. Uh, sorry, Adrian. 
No, 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 complete. I, I love, I love hearing your, 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 uh, your comments. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the way that it was like Asin can be translated a few, a few ways. Like the best of it, and I think uh, Mustafa talked about like the beauty aspect, and I think mm. he responded to that. I always found that interesting because um, I don't know if, if like I'm, I'm not an expert in Arabic or anything, but I, so I, I, I'm not sure if you would read this the same way. But this whole fact where you talk about following the most beautiful of it. Doesn't this this seem to uh, imply a sense that people have to have this intuition to be able to recognize the what what is good and and bad or what's beautiful and not beautiful in the words they receive, right? Because we say that the Quran, the Sunnah, this is knuckle, right? This is transmitted knowledge, right? And then we have to understand it through our aql. But isn't this verse sort of pointing to the fact that we're judging words by some kind of intuitive understanding of of beauty and what's asan? What would you say? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you're right that we do have an a kind of intuitive, subjective um, receptivity to what the aesthetic, to what is beauty. Now, naturally, that may vary, as it will, unquestionably. But I think there is a great overlap in certain, at a simple level, and by simple not to... Uh, demean that, simple meaning it's in some ways as Leonardo da Vinci, the highest form of sophistication, but in things like landscapes, in nature, in recognizing the beauty of, you know, of a, uh, of a rainbow, of a waterfall, of, 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 of things that just seamlessly flow. And human beings, we can definitely, I think there it would be an immense intersubjectivity in a lot of this. And we've recognized a kind word. We recognize the beauty in kindness. We recognize the beauty in compassion. Uh, I don't think there is really a, um, a, a discrepancy in the frequency there. Um, we do have differences naturally when it comes to preferences. So human beings, you know, whether somebody likes a certain thing, likes a certain color, likes a certain food, dislikes, detests, these things are, I think are definitely secondary tertiary aspects. But where the Quran is saying, I mean, could you r remind us the uh, what Jordan Peterson was summing up there? That that point because it was a very powerful point. But I, I'm because he he puts it in such a, a powerful way because I remember when he was saying it, I was like, whoa! <laughs> but I'm trying to. Because uh, 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 they're speaking about following, and uh, Mustafa Akial says that, yeah, because of interpretations. And they're speaking about any book, like he says, obviously in the Bible as well, because there's war and there's these things and people quoting things. And, and he says, yes, but, you know, that you're told to follow that, which is uh, Dr. Mustafa Akial tells him about the verse and he picks up on it. But do, do, can you recap what he sums it up as? Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, um, other than the fact that he appreciated the verse, I'm not exactly sure which direction he brought it with respect to his own thoughts. So that's something that I'll that I'll go back into and look at. Sure, because I'll, I'll get it. Because he, what he's saying is that he speaks about this. What you're saying, this appreciation for beauty, but mm -hmm. this linking it with the divine, that this kind of innate, right. and also with the word. But but the fact that you can do that, he he highlight and he he puts it in such a good way, and I I, I just wouldn't do justice uh, in trying to sum it up. But what you're saying is that do we have different appreciation of beauty? So some person, you know, when if we're supposed to be following the most beautiful kind of teachings, does that first of all denote that some are not so beautiful? I I wouldn't. Put it like I wouldn't put it like that in that sense, but I would say that there clearly uh, it could be understood as in better, or it could be understood as in what is you know more aesthetic, more beautiful in the sense of the teachings, because some things are there trying to say, well, look, because there's some verses that say, you know, you can do this, like this is the bare minimum. So, for example. Um, you know that Allah doesn't have a a pro problem with those people that you know you you show this kind of kindness to them. For example, if they didn't declare war on you and they didn't kind of do this and certain verses, but but there's 
greater there's greater acts that you can do to fulfill so for example you it says you know you can feed the poor but you can do much more as well in other verses it, there are sometimes a teaching of a minimum and there's uh, a higher level in certain verses that are given and obviously there's there's for example in some verses that you can fight but in some verses it says that you can forgive you know it's it, there's there's different obviously there's different teachings based on on the situation now a person following the most beautiful of 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 what he can to his capacity the fact that do i think people will disagree on what they find i don't think i think people will generally get it for the most part they yeah if that's the question but i'm not sure i'm fully understanding is there something is there a different angle to to this uh, well, from my perspective, um, I mean, this verse has meant a lot for, for me uh, personally. Uh, again, I'm not sure if I'm understanding. Like, uh, I mean, it, it gets tricky with, with respect to your subjective understandings of the Quran because you have these senses of things. But then if you want to be careful, you got to think, oh, am I understanding this Arabic correctly? And is this with this interpretation, oh. even though it's meaningful, is it technically correct? So that's where. You, oh, right. OK. Where, right. where okay. I, would, I would tend to. Hold that, hold on to that meaning, but then also look to experts to see if the my intuition is actually oh, of course. some kind of reality. Sorry, but, sorry, I, I didn't understand. I, I completely got you know the wrong end of the the question. So I, in that sense, if you're asking when a person reads the Quran and he takes a certain understanding, um, now this may be a novice kind. Of, uh, sorry, a novel understanding. It may be something totally new. Um, is he, you know, should he be double checking with classical traditional understandings? Should he be? Then I would say yes, of course. And it depends what verses and what he's taking. You see, oh. I would say if it's inspiration, then you can just take it however you receive it. It's not that that doesn't have to be checked and balanced. And if it's if it's just positivity, if it's a message of of kindness, if it's if it's just something like that, then you don't need to be too worried or just just the fact you get it and it inspires you is 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 it. But if it's rulings in the Quran, which are only a tiny portion of the Quran, then in that case, that's different. You know, if you're looking at a very legal aspect of the Quran, which is trying to tell you about doing something, then then in that case, yes, of course, that has a whole different, you know, whole realm with it of people that have advised what that means. Yeah, no, of course. Um, so yeah. I was just saying, uh, obviously, prefacing the fact that I'm not I'm not an expert in the tafsir, but like what m my personal experience with the way that I've understood uh, understood uh, this part of this verse is that uh, just like your last speaker a little bit, um, you know, not that I've ever left Islam, but like I think a lot of us have struggled with specific issues throughout their life and trying to develop and trying to find people to answer their questions. And I think that this whole attitude where I think it becomes problematic for a lot of people who who have dogmatic views is that they have confined the choices of who they're getting their views from. And so they're not actually no. listening to different people. They're not listening no. to the statements and they're not choosing what's essence. Yeah, exactly. So, so what, 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 what I've found to do, and I don't know if this is the correct understanding of this verse, but it, it seems meaningful to me is that I started listening to more people than the typical people. So sure. uh, and Excellent. it started Excellent. around 20 years um, ago, um, it started with people like Shabir Ali, and then he interviewed yeah. Tariq Ramadan, and I started understanding that there's a broader tradition. And then eventually yeah. it led to people like uh, Gamdi Saab, which, I was, uh, which I'm very involved with. I'm actually uh, part of the youth affairs in uh, the Muslim Wow. Muslim. Okay. To, to extend my personal salam and love to him, I absolutely yeah. adore him. We, and yeah. And we actually, and uh, it's, it's very interesting because a lot of our fans are actually, a lot of your fans are very interconnected with what we're doing. Your yeah. Discord <laughs> group, which was something that I joined actually, we springboarded a Discord group for Al Maurid youth off of that, and we have a, wow. a huge amount of interaction back and forth. And we're doing yeah. some interesting things. Um, maybe yeah. sometime I'll reach out to you and see if there's absolutely at your Allah's ordinance at your service. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that would be amazing, Mufisa, because again, you're one of the people that you know, if you're around 20 years ago, like it would have been, uh, as a, as a, you know, in this in this public capacity, it could have helped people like me at that time. But Alhamdulillah, you know, we've gone through what we've done, and we've, we've yeah. all have our own journey. 
Absolutely. No, shukran. And, and just to just to kind of uh, just add uh, a few words to what you said, that you see what you're saying is spot on in seeing that sometimes you may, you know, people, for example, may listen to anyone and not like, we spoke about Jordan Peterson, many people don't like some, some, some things he says, many people don't like many things I say. Many people may not like something you mentioned, Ramdi Saab, or earlier on we mentioned Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, or anyone, or you know. The point is when people are saying good things that you do that does resonate with you, just take that. You know, you don't need to you see this verse is also so beautifully powerful in 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 dislodging prejudice because it shows that. You, you know, they can be people you don't like, but they, they'll they always be some things that they're saying that will still make sense to you. you they, they're not like, it's not a zero-sum game. They're absolute villains or they're absolute good guys. It's, you know, it's just human human beings. And I think, yeah, that's a really good point you made about, look, you go to diverse people, you take different things, you enrich your own understanding and thereby enrich your journey. So, yeah, yeah so shukran. And just to, just to build on that a little bit, a lot of the discussion that we've been having in your fan server and in the Almoda server with respect to like the controversy of Jordan Peter Peterson, positive and negative, is the attitude okay. that I've, I've tried to take and tried to impart is that um, the sort of attitude with respect to um, thinkers, yeah. um, from, from my point of view, the attitude, a mature attitude that should be taken is one where you separate the individual, their personality and their behavior from their thought. And you look at the thought atomistically, mm. you look at different parts of their thought and not mm. necessarily as something where you're, you're going to force it to exist in its, con in, in its existing configuration. You can take it apart and take parts of it, right? And, mm. and, I think that, and I think that this is so easy to understand when we look at people who are physicists or mathematicians mm. or natural scientists where we could absolutely hate a person with respect to some of their behavior. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I'm talking yeah. like there, there, there might have been like um, you know some some scientists that sympathize with Nazis, right? Yeah, but yeah, exactly. They still, they still contributed towards maybe like a, a theory of logic or something, right? Yeah. Like uh, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly about the history of. I don't know if you've heard of Gottlieb Frege, who's uh, involved yes, yes, yes. in the creation of predicate calculus, and you know, well, I, mm. I would use predicate calculus. There's, there's some, there, there's a cost-effective analysis. So I'm an economist by oh. background. And mm -hmm. cost effectiveness analysis, as um, our, my uh, health economics prof professor told me, that this was sort of developed in the area, era of Vietnam uh, in, as part of their war policy to get the most effective sort of killing power wow. uh, uh, with respect to, you know, and so it was a type of analysis that's developed, but now we use it for analysis of healthcare. So the, the, the thought or the analysis or the value of that thought is independent of, you know, the people who developed it and the uses for which yeah. they developed it. And so when we can do that with all these other subjects, it's just strange. It's it's a bit of an immature, immature attitude from my perspective that you can't do that when it comes to thought on, you know, issues like religion sometimes or social science or politics. They just become so uh, sort of deeply infused with emotion that you can't yeah. you can't take that analytical approach and from my perspective if you if you do that then you can at least still engage important thoughts and i i concur completely with you with respect to the 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 importance of jordan peterson's thought for with respect to thinking about modern social movements yeah. and, uh, and having a certain uh, respect for the sacred yeah um, Right. Absolutely. No, shukran, shukran. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. And uh, just just even just what you've contributed here and just discussing this, I think it's it's definitely very uh, interesting and thought provoking for many people. So shukran, Sean. Um, uh, just just but, one last thing. Um, sure. I know that you're running out of time, but just one last thing I'd like I'd like to leave with you, and maybe you can look into this sure. sometime. Is because with your discussion of subjectivity uh, and uh, you know understanding knowledge through the subject, I wonder if you've ever looked at John Searle's work on uh, ontological versus epistemological subjectivity and objectivity. Have you ever you, are you familiar with the philosopher John Searle? John said, no, no, I haven't actually. He's like a philosopher of language and philosopher of mind. Okay. And he, okay. distingu he distinguishes between two different categories of subjectivity and objectivity. Okay. And he says that not understanding this is, a, is an area for major confusion with respect to the scientific study of subjective phenomenon, such as consciousness. Okay. 
Okay. And so the idea is that on uh, something that's ontologically subjective is it's subjective because <clears throat> it's existence. So ontology has to do with existence. This, uh, yes, yes, yes. existence. And something that's ontolo ontologically subjective, subjective is subjective because um, it's existence. Uh, the existence of of having that understanding depends on the uh, the subject. It it can only be understood through the subject. So things like pain, emotion, they can only be understood through the subject, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the re the reason why these these th things may not be uh, uh, epistemologically subjective is because many things that are experienced through the subject are considered mm -hmm. valid inquiries for science, because there's a belief that these things mm -hmm. are correlated with some under, underlying phenomena. And, and if you look at like uh, medical uh, uh, literature, for example, scientific study of symptoms, mm -hmm. for example, where, yeah. you know, people are talking about feeling a pain in a certain place, feeling nauseous, all of these are ontologically subjective phenomenon, but they're not mm -hmm. epistemologically subjective. They're actually correlated with real underlying phenomenon. And so it, the, I think the important point that he makes, and I think this is really, really important for mm -hmm. people of faith, is that people need to understand that every uh, every single item of subjective okay, yeah. experience... I, I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. is, I is get not, it, yes. It's not so. something that, that um, is not a, like an invalid type of knowledge. It can, and it's not yeah. something that can't be scientifically studied as, as well. I, I Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. So, hmm, but the only... The only difference there would be that it would still be virtually impossible to qualify the experience from an objective uh, perspective. So, so for example, whether it's the same symmetrical experience. So, for example, somebody, let's say, has to prick a you know a needle here. Now I could feel pain. Now the pain is the uh, the, as you're saying, the the kind of subjectivity, the subjective perception here, but there is an underlying ontological reality to it in the sense that nerves have been triggered and something has gone in and the nerves have kind of come back and obviously the, the central nervous system is, pick, is picked up, something's happened and it's obviously given this immediate reaction and, and I felt, and, and that's all explicable. However, the degree of pain or the experience, qualitatively speaking, I suppose we could we could say that you know I'm sure it's it's roughly the same, or people, but it would be virtually impossible to truly qualify it. Well, what I would say is it would be difficult to precisely qualify it, and there might be some there's. But there's pain, be... okay, pain is one, but let's say the things like smell or things like. Um, even though there is an intersubjectivity that we recognize that, for example, uh, patchouli has a particular smell and whether, you know, certain uh, different kind of masks and different things will smell differently. But now, but really, truly speaking, to be able to, to symmetrically, unless we could somehow map neurons that are triggered in the brain and we could kind of kind of say, well, it triggers the identical <laughs> and we're using that as a I don't know how because that would well, be really I mean, tricky to, I, I, to, to I think I think you're getting towards the question of precision and and mm. the question of understanding something uh you know uh, whether we understand something with error or we understand something with correlation and there's possible error in that and I think that that's that's like a that's like a normal thing that happens in in empirical study anyways right no so give an so, example like self-reported health or self-reported yeah. quality of life like mm -hmm. these are things that show up all of the time in uh in um um uh, health studies yeah. and we yeah. and we also would uh sort of but study, you, study their predictors with respect to disease yeah. categories Right? No, of course. No, I'm not saying I'm saying these things are the world works by them and there is an intersubjectivity and it works. But I'm just saying to, to the problem with totally narrowing things, second secondary qualities or this kind of qualia of things like this of smell, of color, even color really. Obviously, it's like it's what, you know, many uh, great thinkers would have said, just good enough. You know, it's good enough. It works. The main thing is it works and we can use it. But I suppose really saying it 
it's it's difficult because so for example if let's say every red you've seen in your life is red but really to everybody else it's a different color but you've called it red because that's how you've been identified with it sorry it's been identified to you so you would always still call it red even if it was in your eyes blue so this this kind of thing is it's that's more a philosophical level we would never it would truly be, know it, it would be the utility of the category would still exist mm. as long as the stability yeah the exactly exactly still exists, so it would right? still so i yeah. get that but do send me this stuff I'll, I'll definitely look into it and definitely find it but now that you instagram, say I, i'm familiar with these is these instagram, debates is instagram the best way to reach out to you or is there yeah a... definitely i mean what to do is reach out to me on instagram then i'll put you on whatsapp <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll we can okay. speak from there in short. Remember so my name. I'm the the Sean. Sean, I ain't gonna forget that. Sean Michaels from the Rockers from the WWF day. <laughs> All, right. All right. When Sean when you know what is it? Uh, Cain and Abel when he turned on his brother. Do you remember that? <laughs> Was I there? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't you? I don't know. Oh, you probably never watched a WWF back in the days. You know when the oh, the, oh. The, the Rockers. You know the young. The, you had the, the with the long hair. The young tag team you had Shawn michaels and i've forgotten his brother's name something Jenny, and, was it something or? uh possibly but then at one point he uh he kind of turns on his brother with, with brutus the barber there and he gets his brother and throws it <laughs> this is going back to childhood <laughs> days now <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could maybe i was there maybe i was there yeah anyway. so that's it but okay so take but, care send me a message there and i will uh definitely uh be in touch so okay sean shukran once again Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Khuda hafiz. People, that was Sean. I was about to say Sean Michaels. That was Sean Sheikh. Right. So joining us, Shukran from uh, from Canada. And some very interesting discussions there. Very deep, very highly intelligent discussions. I like it. Wow, just caught me off guard as well. I like it. I like it, people. The, the brain cells are at work. Let's see. You know what? We're going to have to soon wrap this up, but I can see some people have been waiting. Um, right. We've got Shahid Kamruddin. Shahid Kamruddin. Assalamu alaikum. Shahid Kamruddin. We can't. I can't hear you. Is it on mute? All right. You're, you're, you're here. We can hear it. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. I can indeed. All right. Hello? I can. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Where are you from? Where are you joining us from, Shahid? Yes. Wa we hear you. Where are you joining us from, Shahid? I think there's a time delay in the video. Is there? Ah, right. Okay. Uh, I can hear you fine. Hello? Yes, I can hear you fine. Shall I remove you and you want to join again? Join um, again. I, I can't hear you. Something happened. Okay, so I'll remove you. Join again. Join again. Okay, so I'll share. use the same link. Come back. Come back and then try. So I, I'll share the link again. That might have been... Sometimes it could be your connection when you join. So if you join straight away, Sean and Marty, look at that. That was it. Martin, that was it. Marty, all right. Somebody here from the good old WWF days. So, okay, whilst he hasn't joined yet, um, I feel everyone is lying. I feel everyone is lying. <laughs> God, Braveheart, don't worry. <laughs> Freedom! That's the main thing. Shahid is back. Let me just add him to the stream. Oh, Assalamu alaikum, Shahid. Wa alaikum salam. All right, where are you joining us from? Uh, from Malaysia. Malaysia. Ah, Allahu Akbar. We are worldwide, people. <laughs> Mr. Wilwa, it's the Dale life, Dale. <laughs> so, how are you doing, Shahid? Are you are you ethnically from Malaysia? Or are you um, some from somewhere else, living in in Malaysia? I, I was born here, but I'm mixed blood. Okay, mixed race. Okay, well, wow, interesting. Go on, tell us a bit of your diversity. What's because you're just gonna have us guessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Malay. Chinese, Indian, 
Uh, wow. Okay. Dutch wow. And Whoa. British. Okay. You turned the volume right up there. I mean, <laughs> what was <laughs> was that? What like the the colonial division of the world? <laughs> yes, yeah, sort of. They were just splitting the whole world up. <laughs> Allah Akbar. Quite quite a bit. Wow. I. You know what? I envy you for all the relatives that you've got in different parts of the world, <laughs> and excuses you have to travel to different countries. I love it. So, all right. So, Shahid, what do you what do you do in Malaysia? Tell us a bit about um, you. Logical engineer. Logical engineer. What is a logical electrical? Engineer? Electrical. Oh. <laughs> wow, I thought what, logical engineer. I, I was I was genuinely curious. Like, <laughs> what does a logical engineer do? So, okay, so electrical engineer. All right, yeah. awesome. So, mashallah, talk to us, Shahid. What are, what are some thoughts? What are, if there's a question? What's on your mind? Unleash um, that wisdom all the way from Malaysia. Is it Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> by the way? Uh, no, about three hours away. Okay, unleash it on us. All right. Uh, I, I watched your old videos about, you know, you, you talk about Adam, uh, and they, they okay. mentioned... Adam being uh, Min Nafsin Wahida. Okay, yes, yes, yes. And you're saying mm -hmm. that probably uh, he's the, the child instead? Ah, uh, right, okay. No, uh, right, okay. Ask the question, then yep. I'll, I'll try uh, to answer. Sure. But then uh, after they got the child, they commit the shirk and, 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 and giving thanks to a different god? Right? Ah, right, okay, okay. So okay. if he's the start of consciousness, how can they have the concept of gods and stuff before that? Okay. Mm. Va. Oh, I like it. Shahid, Sha told me you're going to come prepared. <laughs> <laughs> no, so first of all, okay, that's not uh, quite how I say it. So I'll just give you some, And but I think this is a really good question, by the way, really good question. So first of all, what I've said is that in the Quran, I think it's six places where Allah says we created mankind. Um, but in none of those verses, the name Adam is used. So he says, And many verses, a few verses like this. That but in none of those verses does Allah say we created you. In those verses, there's a certain template. And it doesn't seem to mention Adam in them. So Adam is mentioned in other verses on many occasions, but not in those verses where it's speaking about the human, uh, the humankind origin. Right. So uh, it just seems to mention you were made from a single soul um, and from a single self. And then from that self, its partner. And then from here, many uh, men and women were, you know, eventually made and so on. So, okay. Now, in one of those verses, it says that uh, they feared that what happened is as he, it doesn't say Adam, but it says as he uh, covered his, uh, you know, his spouse. It doesn't say spouse, but his, his, the, his partner that's in the female, she was of womb. And then when she gave birth, it mentions that they commit shirk, that they do, you know, uh, they ascribe shuraka a little bit because they fear that maybe the baby won't survive or something. And so they, what the verse is touching on is superstition that exists. And it then mentions that obviously it goes on to say that, you know, so some people have said, you're right, some people have said that was Adam. But I've said that I, I didn't agree with that understanding that the person committing shirk was Adam. But this must have been a predecessor to Adam. Okay, So somebody before Adam that would have existed. So most ulama all agree that creatures existed before Adam. So Adam was not the first creature. Now, they disagree, was he the first human, as in we know humans? But obviously, back then, the scholars didn't, there wasn't much evidence of other findings as well. So other bones and other things, and they don't really know these things with that kind of detail. So 
what we have is basically we have very ancient bones and we have findings that show us that look humans have varied along the way and then you have humans today homo sapiens with a certain kind of dna neanderthal dna is different it varies you know heidelbergensis would be different there will be habit homo habilis will be different australopithecus would be different all these things would be slight variations but there's a great similarity coming down now, even with Homo, uh, Homo sapien, it's, it seems to be a long trek, but it's only in the recent, you know, 100,000 years that really this human journey as we know it has started. This kind of out of Africa journey begins. So the question is, well, where does Adam fit in with all of this? So, well, okay, ultimately, we don't know. Nobody knows as a fact. Nobody knows, well, I, I was there. I know, nobody knows. So we can only just speculate. So one way of speculating is saying, well, Adam somehow exists before all of this. So he's at the beginning of, so let's say hom hominins go back, maybe anything between, I don't know, let's say 4 million years. Let's say some have said whether well, it's 7 million, depends where you place the marker. Now, for some reason, we place them there. Let's say we place them two million years with Homo erectus and Homo augusta and these kind of where, where they discover fire. <coughs> but we know the humans that lived then were not like humans today. They were not sophisticated. They were very primitive. They were very, uh, you know, they, they, could, they could make tools. That, so they were slightly cleverer than chimpanzees. But they weren't that much cleverer than chimpanzees. They were probably slightly somewhat cleverer than chimpanzees and stuff, but they weren't as clever as, let's say, a five-year-old child. They weren't that clever because obviously we have findings from, they didn't produce things that, that lasted. They didn't, but they did live. But we know Adam, let's say if we, those who believe in Adam believe Adam was very sophisticated, was incredibly intelligent. So then you only can have one of two ways. Let's say he existed then. So what we're saying is Adam existed. He was incredibly intelligent. He dies. Humans somehow become really primitive and clumsy and, and dumb. And, and then they stay dumb for, let's say, four million years. And then suddenly they become intelligent again. And then they become really intelligent again. So that, that's one theory, let's say, some people could put it. The other theory is, no, when humans became suddenly what they call the cognitive revolution, this the person who began that is Adam, and we are all his offspring. So that's the other theory of looking at it. So somebody could choose anything. You know, somebody could say, no, I want to believe, because nobody, we, nobody has any proof about Adam, salam, whether he existed and where he existed. And we can't say, I can't say for a fact that Adam salam, existed at that point or at this point. This is all speculation, but everybody's speculating. So if a person was to say, look, Adam salam, existed before Homo erectus, and then he was just this really intelligent person. Let's say even if his sons were, but for some reason they die, then the DNA changes. Because remember, the DNA keeps changing. And in that case, our DNA from back then is not 100% the same. So we then are DNA, we are varied from that being back then. The other thing is why there's 4 million years of just becoming animals again like they're just like animal homo erectus they're not i mean they're they're hominins but they're very animal like they're not like us like they're more them like so for so many millions of years, at least two million years this is going on then suddenly all of a sudden humans become really inspired and they become everything so okay somebody could believe that you know if they want to believe it that's fine the other way is that well no when the cognitive revolution begins that is adam now that would mean, let's say you took this route, the cognitive revolution route. Then in that case, before Adam, hominins exist. But they just don't have consciousness the way we have it.
But they have some consciousness because, look, even animals have some consciousness. Primates, monkeys today even have some consciousness. Dolphins have consciousness. Elephants are self-aware. That You know, like some consciousness already exists even today in animals. It's like, and it's not a low level. It's it's a pretty good level for the, given the animal status. Like elephants will mourn the dead. They They have memories. They remember even after a decade, they will remember, oh, this person, this place, they... You know, chimpanzees, they're very sophisticated for their own thing. And and hominins were more sophisticated than them. So Neanderthals were much more, obviously, cleverer than chimpanzees. So in that case, let's go with this theory, that they, the, the hominins that existed would have had, uh, you know, some level of a higher consciousness, just not like us, though, the way we can do it. And they would have been the forerunners to, to this huge revolution, which would have began with one person. In this case, in this theory, would have been Adam, salam, and he would have ate something. Now, according to some people, that would have been uh, what they call the stoned uh, man theory, is or the stoned ape theory, some scientists call it, is that he would have consumed some kind of uh, psychedelic, which they feel maybe some particular strains of mushrooms or certain things that are millions of years old. So they are, in fact, much older than, you know, all us kind of beings. So they've been existing. And, and, and you know, things like mushrooms, by the way, are not from the plant kingdom. They are a separate entity, so they are actually closer to humans than they are than plants are closer. To, than, you know, so they they are a separate entity. Fungi is not a plant, even though it grows mycelium, grows like roots and stuff. But it's not to be confused with it being a plant, even though we eat it. But it's not a vegetable. It's not mushrooms are not technically vegetables. They are fungi. So. And they have communicating networks. So they have a form of, even today, trees communicate, but they communicate through mycelium, you know, through mushroom roots under un, under the earth. So according to this theory, that ma that many hominins for, for, you know, for time had been consuming these things and it had been edging up the consciousness, but it just hadn't exploded. It needed that final explosion. And that, according to this theory, some person did it. Now, could that person who consumes this forbidden fruit be Adam Ali Salam? Could it? Could this story still coincide? Certain people believe it can. I also agree that it can. It doesn't have any clash. It seems to also make sense that this is. And why would it be a forbidden fruit? Well, it would make sense because mushrooms are also very deadly. They also kill people. They also kill creatures. So it's one of those, you know, potluck. It could kill you. It could just be food or it could give you a transcendental experience of, you know, witnessing. So in this theory, the predecessors, the pre-Adamites wouldn't have had the same consciousness, but they would have had some. And they may have had rituals. They may have had superstitions. They may have had a kind of ascribing to for life. Like even Franz de Waal in his book on Bonobo and the Atheist speaks about, is it possible that monkeys have got superstitions? And he says that even though it's right now impossible to prove, but he says it's possible. And he speaks of the rain dance that some of them do in that particular book. But it's possible that that these people had some shirk at their level. Obviously, they weren't mukallaf in that way. They weren't, you know, they weren't, uh, insan, but they would have been Bashar, as uh, Dr. Abdul Sabur Shaheen distinguishes them. But this is just a theory. You know, people, you know, obviously there's no proof that any of this happened in that way. Just as the other thing is still a theory. You know, if a person wants to believe that no, Adam came in the beginning, uh, he came several million years of years ago, and then everybody kind of stooped. Humanity didn't, wasn't humans, there were more animals for millions of years, and then suddenly in the last 100,000 years, they became humans again. Then that's, you know, it's it's how do, does a person want to fit it? To me, I agree with those people that say this makes sense. Somebody could say, no, I want to go with the other way. It's entirely up to them. Uh, 
could it be that you know, like the the verse where God told the angels that He's gonna bring a Khalifa? Yeah. Yeah. So could the Khalifa not be a, actually a human or individual, but instead the concept uh, the concept of consciousness itself? So God will give consciousness to a group of humans. That oh, Khalifa is an embodiment. It's okay. So it's it's a metaphor for consciousness in Nijab. Yeah, so in so when he was when he gives that uh, to a group of people, they can inherit uh, the world instead, instead of having one individual. So that we are part of that Khalifa okay, also. <laughs> wow, that, I mean, that's not the common understanding, but I, I like what you're saying. I mean, it's very profound. It's uh, you know, it's very spicy. <laughs> I, I like, it. I like it. I mean, it's, 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 it's. You know, it's. I suppose it's just a different way of looking at things, and it's like, wow. Because when okay. the when the angels say they will cause destruction, I'm sure that's referring to us. No, yeah. So I, I think uh, referring to us also. So we cause fossil fuels pollution and all this. So I think yeah. uh, the Khalifa must be part of us also because we are also causing the problems. Yeah. You see, I think those people who say this theory, the, the cognitive revolution theory, they are saying this, but they're saying it in personified as the man, as Adam is the one that consciousness is given to. And this is what the angels are objecting to. If, you, if you're saying that here this is a... Let's say this is an allegory, a metaphor for saying Khalifa is in itself referring to consciousness itself as the noun, as uh, we are now placing consciousness on the earth. It, it gives it a very much different flavor, although the story is still very much the same. You know, it, it doesn't change the story because obviously Adam is, according to us, the first being of consciousness, of, of our true consciousness. So... Yeah, but it just gives it a whole different flavor. You know, Allah is saying it's not about a person. He's saying we are giving consciousness. To, we are giving earth consciousness <laughs> or placing consciousness onto earth. That is, uh, wow, I, 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 I like what you're saying. I mean, it's it definitely adds spice and flavor to it. And, and uh, also another part of that, uh, it seems like, like uh, the world and uh, nature and evolution is uh, going to a point where we will be able to recognize the world. Like, you know how uh, we can see the moon uh, and the size of the moon relative to the sun is also equal to the distance between the moon and the sun. So that it's like 400 times different. So when the moon goes over the sun, uh, it becomes a full eclipse. Where does it happen anywhere else? And then in physics, that helps us because uh, we can see more of the sun and part of the sun will be hidden so that we can see the corona and stuff. But then it only will be applied if there's something that can recognize it. Okay, so uh, sorry, that that part kind of went over me. Like, are you are you saying like consciousness? Are you speaking about the earth becoming conscious? No, no, no. Speaking? So it seems like uh, like in evo like evolution, uh, going towards a, a creature that can uh, be aware. Okay. Hmm. So that when it reaches that point, then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll be given consciousness. Because the Earth has been around for like what four point five billion years with oh, the dinosaurs. Oh yes, yes, yes. So yes, of course. So it's when the time is ready, when the stage is set. Yes. Allah says, "Now, in ilum fil ardi khalifa." Yeah. So that's, that's now... what my feeling is. Yeah. Wow. No, of course, of course. So creation, life has existed for so long, even since the Cambrian explosion, at least, you know, you're talking almost 500 million years and mammals have been around between two to 300 million years, but it's not an even hominins, you know, as in human like structures have been around for at least a couple to a few million years. But it's, you know, we are like, you know, we're not, we're just like a second on this clock when, when we put it into perspective. We're just like one, that's it. And yet so much has happened in this. It's amazing we've unlocked the whole, and, you know, people attributed to Sayyidina Ali, and the, the saying that, that you claim that you are this small entity. Yet within you is the cosmos kind of all folded up because you see the universe truly in a way it you know it's, as as uh, alan watts says that it comes to see itself through our eyes because we are the observer ain't we in essence when you think about yeah. it we are 
the, the, the you know we it is through our consciousness that we recognize it and we recognize its life and that which is witnessing and that which is witnessed you see wa shahidin wa mashhud allah you know was sama'i that in buruj that wa shahidin wa mashhud that we are ultimately in many ways the universe witnessing ourselves it's 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 incredibly profound but yeah i i i love what you're saying as well shahid wow you definitely uh surprised us at this late hour <laughs> so shukran shukran for that uh, uh, uh can i add, add, add a second question yeah sure actually related for, okay yeah go for it uh yeah in, Just... in story of uh ibrahim you know when mm -hmm. uh so it, when i read it my understanding is like he went out of the city he sit on the hill and then when, when night came he saw a star and it disappears, and he saw the moon, and it, it disappears, and he saw the sun, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But before that, God says, we show him this, in the sky. But okay. to me, like, I don't think he was blind. I think he, he was he's seen it for the last, like, 20 years or so. So what does the show <laughs> there mean? Yeah, so, hmm. you see, I, okay, that's, I'll, I'll have to bring the verse up, but what I would believe because i've got a video on ibrahim salam, and I, I advise people to watch it's an older video but it's about you know, according to uh my research he is from the indus valley or his origins are definitely from the indus valley and i feel this is according to me definitely i'm not saying it's definite as a fact because obviously as a fact you can't we can't prove that ibrahim at least i'm existed as a fact it's a, it's a matter of faith so I, I think we could can we how uh because uh some the star that appears and disappears there cannot be a star it has to be uh, a planet because no uh, no i mean the 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 what i mean is that the person of ibrahim alayhi salam is a person that we obviously we we believe he existed it's a matter of faith we can't as a fact prove he exists that's what i was saying because obviously whether the person existed we can't prove like you can't prove like there's no bones there's no dna there's nothing to say this person with this name as a fact as a historical artifact archaeologically speaking you can't prove you can't prove moses you can't even prove jesus but you can you can prove the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but um, uh, but you can't prove the others but i think we can prove the astro astronomical event when the oh yes oh yes no no of course of course no so i'm not so we obviously as muslims believe in it so what i was saying the reason i just mentioned that is because i said i definitely believe he was from the indus valley and then i was just qualifying the word definitely by saying that oh, this okay. is my opinion obviously i don't mean definitely definitely because i can't prove that but then again nobody can even prove that he existed yeah. it's obviously a matter of faith and a matter of opinion and perspective that's what i was saying so so Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to my understanding, was somebody of, he would have been of Indus Valley, so of ancient Indian origin, that, that Indian, not Indian as in India, Indian, but Indus Valley origin. Now, what we know is that that civilization was and still remains to be deeply, or the, the, the kind of whatever you, remnants you have, deeply involved in astrological uh, affairs so this whole thing about astrology and the stars and i according in that video i highlight that i would have i believe he would have been from the priestly class which and, and many people have highlighted the oh you know the overlap between brahmin and brahman and abram because he he's, he changes his name according to the bible and even according to the quran is the name changes but it's uh his name was not uh Ab ibrahim or even abraham it was abram and then it changes into into something so the overlaps are significant according to that theory uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam would have been very well versed with the stars and all this astrology. And this is why he was from the priestly, he was from that class. And even according to the Bible, his his family, they say they were from Ur. So in the Old Testament, it says he was from Ur, which is northeast, is the top upper part of Iraq. But it says it, his, his family originally were from the east. It says that in, in the Bible. So, but it just doesn't explain where 
from the east. And I've mentioned that would have been the Indus Valley, and after the flood, they would have moved further westwards. So if he knew, had this knowledge, and he was from the priestly class, as the Bible mentions, his father was, was a priest and so on. So he would have had this knowledge and he would have understood stars. So when Allah is saying that he, we had showed him the celestial bodies because he had a very good knowledge of them. And it wasn't just, uh, and this is why when he's saying, look at this, star, he, in the Quran, he points out just celestial bodies. Because there, there is a deep link there between that old priestly class and the astrology and astrology and even when he comes to egypt you see what i postulate in my theory is that uh hajar who often people say is a slave girl was not a slave girl she was a priestess because it would make sense that he's honored with a priestess but maybe the priestess to sarah is considered as like they treat her as though she's a slave because of her kind of outcast. They look at her as though she's they you know she's some kind of different caste kind of and people treat her like she, as though she's some slave because she's a foreigner, but she's not actually a slave. That she in essence was a priestly woman because the priestly women also lived in the palaces of the pharaoh, and it makes sense why Abraham would have had an, an audience with the Pharaoh, with the Pharaoh. Because why would a person who just comes get to get a one-on-one -on -one with the Pharaoh? Like, why? Yeah. What's so special about any man? Because the Pharaoh wouldn't just meet normal people. And the reason he would have met him is because he would have been this incredibly wise person about astrology, about the stars and things. Because the Pharaohs were also into that. And this is why when he, according to this understanding, he sends with Abraham uh, Hajar. He gives her, and obviously Abraham marries her. Now, they go off towards Arabia. Now, it's interesting that you see one of the most sacred stars in Egyptian astrology, uh, what they call uh, Osiris, the, the special ancient Egyptian, you, you know, Osiris, who he is, the great figure of, you know, he's like the, one of the most beloved heroes of the god heroes of Egyptian mythology, is Canopus in, in English today. And that is the, the major star of uh, the Southern Hemisphere. You can't see it in the Northern Hemisphere where we are. So uh, this star, Canopus, is in Arabic, Suhail, which is the star which in line with which the wall of the Kaaba is built. It's aligned with Sohail. Oh, okay. So it's interesting that, yes, this could be a coincidence or it could be. And Canopus appears, Sohail appears on the horizon after sunset. It appears in a straight angle right there you see on the horizon. That's why they knew which direction Sohail would, is in. And... And Allah says in the Quran about the, the ancient people, what you know, what bin Najmihum Yahtadun, that they are guided through the through through the astrological kind of bodies. So this shows that it would make sense as well because he goes with Hajar and then he builds the Kaaba. And that she was also because Sahail was not a star that the, the northern hemisphere was so familiar with, you see, because uh, whereas this is more in the southern hemisphere, and I, I'm just I'm showing these are obviously speculative. Uh, they don't change anything. They're nothing. Every the story is still the same. Everything is the same. It just has a different detail to it. That oh, that's really fascinating, and it just gives an answer to some questions like why did the pharaoh meet him why did why was the kaaba built in a certain way in line with certain stars uh why did you know like these things it just adds why is it that ibrahim al -Islam, is being mentioned as giving the example of celestial bodies in the quran it just kind of gives a little flavor to it that's the story remains the same even if somebody says no none of that is true he's just uh you know he's always from uh, let's say north eastern iraq and he always uh you know he just got lucky and met the pharaoh and he just whether you have a totally different version the story is still the same it doesn't really change it just gives it a different flavor that's all
So uh, the story of the idols being broken could be uh, in India instead of in Mesopotamia. No, that no, no. So they would have long left that Indian thing because of the floods. So either he wasn't alive at the time when they, or he was very young when they've left from the flood. Because the because what happens in history, you see the Indus Valley civilization comes to an end. Yeah. And when it comes to an end, where do the people go? So the general historians and anthropologists say they migrated westwards. So they went okay. towards, because where did the people go? Because obviously they didn't live there once the, the flood happened. And it was a huge civilization. One of the ancient civilizations of man is the yep. Indus Valley civilization. So, so generally people say, well, they went westwards, but we don't know, you know. So hence you get a lot of these, names as well and the in the overflow they seem very kind of indian as well that kind of indus valley in origin you know like even names like the gilgamesh the great things of mesopotamia and even the mitanni people who settle in the middle east and and they have this obviously very powerful people as well and all these it's they their names also seem to have that kind of tone to it but yeah this is all just guess and you know it doesn't mean anything nobody has to take it too seriously it's just thoughts but okay yeah so yep. um cool so shukran uh for that shahid i appreciate it we are getting late here so yep. but shukran do send me a message on instagram i'll look out for you take care once again jazakallah Shuk and shukran thank you likewise people that was shahid kamaruddin i got carried away in the discussion as i mentioned it was epic having him on there and just getting carried away. Somebody said, uh, uh, Mal Spring, yeah, kept, kept, repair. I have, you think about the question of the most Spring, of the most Spring. Uh, I don't know. That must be to someone else. Okay. Um, Ibrahim alayhi salam could be around the Mahanjadaro time. It could be, or he's, um, when Mahanjadaro, or but what we know is that the Indus Valley civilization is coming to an end and people migrate. And we're talking of you know hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, you know, obviously, where do they go because they don't stay there anymore? <laughs> so they definitely go somewhere. And many uh anthropologists feel that they migrated uh westwards towards the Middle East. And this is why the Bible says that about Abraham, that his, his family were from Ur, which is Ur, which is in North, Eastern, Middle East. But they say, but the Bible says is, but the origins were from the East. It just doesn't mention we're in the East. And some people have argued that, um, but in my clip, I go through all of this anyway, that um, they even speak about why, some people felt that the term Hebrew was used because of passing through, that they passed through the river and stuff like this. But this is all speculation. You know, what I say is that if it interests you, if it creates a passion in you, then research it, look into it, get those, you know, brain cells firing away. If it doesn't interest you, it's nothing to get so preoccupied about it's fine, you know, you can you can hear something and as the verse that we covered today, those who hear something and they follow that, which to them is the best of it. So if something doesn't appeal to you, don't worry, these things are just opinions. You have to learn to accept that people, certain they may have certain passions, your passions may vary. Guys, it's been a hell of an evening. Let's wrap this up. So those of you that have already, I, I, there's been quite a few. Yeah, so somebody mentioned just very quickly because it kind of linked in why Ibrahim Ali Salam's name was mentioned. Because in some recitations, I believe it has been read as Abraham because his name changed as the Bible mentions as well. So in Surah Baqarah, it is spelt slightly differently. And in the other verses of the Quran, it's spelt with Ibrahim. Um, and I believe that's to represent that name change. Allahu alam with that. Guys, uh, let's, there's a super chat. Sami, much love, shukran. Thoughts for spreading, thought-provoking knowledge and giving hope to lost travelers of this world. As always, much appreciated. Guys, if you haven't already liked, subscribed, do like, do subscribe, do share this amongst your loved ones, the near and dear, and get it out there. Let's, uh, other than that, if you need to uh, reach out, 
you're more than welcome instagram i do check uh quite regularly as i can um if you need more support than just messages then you're more than welcome to uh, go to uh, what you can see there uh i'll just oh look at that <laughs> i'm trying to bring that up no has it gone add to stream oh there it is oh no not that but this it's got that ignore the, the that discussion there but it's what what we're looking at is patreon you can go to patreon and you can just there it is all right people you can just subs subscribe there and inshallah you can get your focused what i call perspective sessions which are one-on-one -on -one sessions but other than that take very good care of yourselves in the words of soda soda khuda ke vaste kar ke sa mukhtasar apni to neend ud gayi tere fasane <laughs> people spread positivity spread love wherever you are remember that that's what it's ultimately all about and i leave you with the words that that usikum that that's my advice usikum that tafano fi hubbillah that have that ego death in the love of god qabla an tafna bi hukmillah before you perish by his command wa salamu alaykum wa khuda hafiz